Do you? I mean, this day and this garden are just for you. How beautiful is it up here? Incredible. Thank you for coming. Thank you for having me on. Let's talk Legos. Legos. <laughs> Legos. <laughs> Was that hello, like, sounded deep enough for it to be belly and button talk or not really? You have to kind of bring it down from here. Okay. You have to hello. go. Hello. No, no, no. Not <laughs> your hand. Hello. hello. And then you go up high. Oh, okay. You start low and go hello. high. Hello. Yeah. No. No. Hey. Hello. Hello. <laughs> What's that? That was just a stupid thing. Well, I'm sure it's stupid. <laughs> It's not about me, is it? No. Not at all. No, me. All right. You know this girl, Claire, I'm seeing? Yeah. Well, he and I started joking that when she falls asleep, her stomach stays awake all night and talks to me. How's it talking? Well, the belly button's like a mouth. I'm bored. OK, so you've played a lot of different Jerry's. Do you know what I mean? You've had the big puffy sleeve Jerry. Yes, I, on the Today Show. Yes. We debuted the puffy shirt on the Today Show with Brian Gumble. That is a very, very unusual shirt you have on. You know, yeah. They're all kind of, kind of puffed up. Yeah, it's a puffy shirt. <laughs> you look kind of like a pirate. <laughs> yeah, like a pirate. Anyway, uh, you know, we're hoping to um, raise enough money with the you know, you know, with this. Look, I'm sorry. It is just a very unusual shirt. It could be kind of a whole new look for you. You know, you could put a, a patch over an eye. You could kind of like be the pirate comedian. Uh huh. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. You've yeah. had some iconic looks. Yeah. What made you think, okay, it's time naturally to be a Lego Jerry? Well, who doesn't want to be a Lego? It's Lego Seinfeld. He's blocky. He's stoppy. He has sea hands. What are we selling here? <laughs> Lego, the reason people love Lego is because they, it clicks together. And once it clicks, it fits. It's tight. And it makes sense. Yes. And the world doesn't make sense. But Lego, you can, you can order the universe with Lego. You can make sense of something. Yeah. If you follow the instructions and you complete the model, it makes sense. Yeah, I mean, I have three little kids. Have you ever stepped on a Lego in the middle of the night? It's painful, yeah. It's not a great thing. You're no. right that they make sense. There's there's moments where you want to throw them, though. Yeah. Does that, is fun that, to throw, too. Is that sort of makes is that sort of you? You know, they're, they're like, Jerry, you make sense, but there's moments where you're like, no, that I've matter. never stepped on a Lego, but it does seem like a killer. Okay. In this short, you say, but I don't want to be a Lego. <laughs> right. But you actually wanted to be a Lego. You, this was I your did, idea. Yeah. How, what was the genesis? Uh, the genesis was Lego made a model of my TV show set, and Netflix bought the TV show and wanted to do a promo, and I went, hey, wait a minute. <laughs> Why can't I be a Lego? <laughs> and, then I, and then I really wanted to do the line again. I don't want to be a pirate. But I, yeah, but I don't want to be a Lego. But I don't want to be a Lego. I know. I, somehow that that is a hard octave to match. You know, there's a whininess to that that's really hard to do. It's it, these are some of the little subtle things of comedy that are very important. So, what did your wife and kids think when you told them you were turning into? They loved it. I got the idea from my son, who was wanted to build his last Lego. He's 16. He thinks he said, you know, I think I got one more Lego <laughs> left in me. One more. I go, why don't you do the set from my TV show. We were walking along and I went, oh, that's the promo. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to make Netflix shrink me down. <laughs> shrink you down and pour actual Lego cereal yes. into your mouth. There, you, the set is incredible. It's exactly it's like your amazing. set. Tell me some of the details you love. I, I love the couch and I love the refrigerator and the stove. And I love wearing the costume. Some of those bits, like, you know, when I skate out in the yes. end, that took an hour and a half oh. of moving an inch at a time. And when I sit down on the couch, that took an hour and a half. The stop motion is not done with humans. Yeah. It's done with props. You know, the last person to do it was Peter Gabriel Sledgehammer. Oh, really? Yes. Humans don't do stop motion. We do it with toys and props. <laughs> you don't ask a person to do this. And now this, and now this, you know. But the fact that, so first of all, somebody told me about this and I thought like, no, no, he, Jerry Seinfeld's not becoming a Lego. <laughs> 
And then they told me you shot it last week. Yeah, last week. So how much fun was it? There was a lot of laughter. It was insane. <laughs> we, it was just this crazy, everybody. We had to hire an animation company to do the stop motion, because I wanted it to be stop motion. And then to build that set, it was all custom made out of foam and then paint and then the plastic finish to make it shiny. I mean, we worked so hard on it. Well, it was so much fun. I bet it was. Yeah. So the amazing Brian Cranston, who is a Tony winner, an Emmy winner, yeah. Oscar nominated. Yeah. You call him on the phone and you're like, hey, you want to be a Lego? He's not a well, Lego. Well, he's an announcer. He's an announcer. Coming this fall to Netflix. Netflix. <laughs> Netflix. Net ne 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 Seinfeld. <laughs> Seinfeld. 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 You call him on the phone and say, want to be in a Lego short? Yeah. And his response was? Love to. He says, I don't know what you're talking about, <laughs> but I trust you. That's what he said. Did you notice the little dentist chair at the end? I sure did. That's Was the that little, a nod uh, to him? I think that's a cookie, what we call a cookie. <laughs> a cookie. <laughs> okay, I thought maybe that would have been a stranger conversation, but it was just pretty basic. Want to be in a Lego short? Let's if, do it. If you're a comedy person, which Brian is, even though he's done a lot of yes. drama, and someone gives you a crazy idea, you go, yeah, that sounds crazy. And what do you love about fatherhood? The chaos, the learning. Is climate change one of your top priorities? What's your message to girls who want to make a difference in their own communities? Believe in yourself. From New Orleans, well, nice to really spend some time with you. Appreciate it. And what do you love about fatherhood? The chaos, the learning. Is climate change one of your top priorities? What's your message to girls who want to make a difference in their own communities? Believe in yourself. Uvalde, Texas, a small town that has become yet another landmark. How long do you think it took for all this damage to occur? You tell us what, what it was like? With our NBC News exclusive. The last couple years, people have been at home on their couches. Right. Is this, is there's like a lot of creativity spurring up in you? Is that why things like this are happening or not really? Maybe. I didn't think about that, but maybe. I, I personally have a, a feel like I really need to have some fun. I really need to make fun things for people. Yeah. That's why I wanted to do this. I go, this is just fun and silly. And I don't see enough of that. Yeah. I like that. It, does, it will make people laugh for yeah. sure. So Netflix has picked up all of these episodes. Yes. Do you think the world's ready? I don't know. <laughs> they weren't when we started back in 89, that's for sure. It took a number of years before people said, what are, what are they talking about? How do they talk? I know that's kind of interesting. So it didn't catch on right away? No, it took four years. The first four years of the show, it was Poorly received, very poorly received. That's forgotten now. Yeah. Yeah. But, and so how did you all have the patience just to wait it through? Well, um, in those days on television, if you got a good demo, yeah. uh, the advertisers wanted to be on your show. So even though we were not good, <laughs> we got a certain audience that was buying like BMWs. So that kept us on the air. Um, I, tell me about being a Lego, the, transforming. It did not look comfortable, I have to tell you. It was okay. I, I was fine with it. I just wanted to be it so bad. <laughs> I wanted to be in the toy. Seems like, you know, so if, it you bought, if you bought that toy yeah. 
and you could get me shrunk yes. in it. Wouldn't that be the ultimate? I'd be very into having you as a Lego, <laughs> but I have to tell you, I, I was worried about you because it looked like oh. there was a little bit of a wedgie in this area. Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. yeah, there's lots of... Just issues. between you and me. We want, there was a there a little issues, wedgie? A lot of issues below the waist. It looks yeah. like it. Yeah. I mean, that, that round area. You yeah. know what I mean? Uh-huh. <laughs> Okay. Um, I loved Netflix's press release. It was brilliant. Did you read it? The new show thing? Yeah. Yeah. It said Netflix will launch 180 episodes of a situational comedy called Seinfeld, created by rising New York comedian Jerry Seinfeld and Larry David, who wrote for Saturday Night Live for a single season. That's right. So how did you feel about, I mean, the fact that they would take a chance on a young New Yorker just like you, did that feel good? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and to make that many shows, not knowing. <laughs> if anyone was going to like it. It was quite a gamble. It really yeah. was. Thank you, Netflix. Yeah. Sitting here with this beautiful view in Rockefeller Center, New York's been through a lot. Yes. You wrote a really beautiful article that I feel like everybody posted online. And um, what does it feel like to be here on this day, beautiful fall day in a city that you love so much? I am uh, humbly uh, proud of uh, that I stuck up for my town. Yeah. I, I just love this town. And, you know, I, I know, I grew up you know, all around here, so you, you know the people, you know what they're made of. You know, you, you're, not, you're not getting rid of this. There is nothing like this anywhere in the world. Mm -hmm. There's a resilience. Too, yes, right? yes. And on a day like this, there's nowhere better to be. No, no, it has a, New York on a beautiful day is really magical. It really is. Yeah. Um, okay, I, I'm just wondering, as a Lego, could could Elaine do her dance? Like, what would that look like? It'd be like? a lot of clicking and yeah. clacking. Kind yeah. of like in, in the knee area? Yeah, the, some of the plastic might crack. Now, does a Lego have a belly button? No. No, so, just I mean, shirt buttons. How would you talk from your belly button? That'd be a really hard thing. Well, we're not going to do the whole series. <laughs> I, have, okay, I have to tell not. you the truth. <laughs> It was really just a joke. Oh, you're not do I no. thought you were doing the whole series as a Lego. Yeah, that's kind of uh, the way it looks. But no, we couldn't do it. <laughs> Too expensive, right? Yeah, yeah. These days. We will meet Ukrainians who are defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. Hey, who's this? Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. From Brooklyn, we're next to the subway station. The state's reservoirs are alarmingly low. War will pass them by. You open the door for so many people. I love working with people. I did not do any of this by myself. Hello. Lizzo, you put a smile on yes. every single face. It feel like Christmas and my birthday or something. <laughs> the, the midterms are here. It's time to plan your vote. We'll provide everything you need to know to successfully cast your ballot. Just select any state you want to learn about for the primary or general election, and you'll instantly get voting rules, see the next big deadline, and learn how to take action for your plan. Voting rules have changed since 2020, and those rules vary from state to state. So it's time to get planning for 2022. Visit NBCNews.com slash plan your vote today. It's a can't miss summer on today. They are walking strong, elegant, and pretty easy to prepare. How to cut costs on your vacation. Vicki has the answers. Every single thing you need for the best summer yet. Only on today. These are our missing daughters and sons. We need anyone who saw something to come forward. She was wearing a black jacket, a black top. I'm going to bring my son home alive. Dateline Missing in America. Listen now wherever you get your podcasts. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. The biggest grievance of 2021 so far. And you don't have to have one if you don't want one. Oh, I've got one? tons. <laughs> um, sounds like a plan. That's because it is a plan. That's what the sound was. Just tell me what time you want to meet. Stop saying the thing sounds like a plan. You know what? Actually, Hoda and I are, and, and actually Savannah, we're in a fight over the word literally. 
because we think oh, it's overused. Way overused. Are you on my side? Totally. They're like, totally well, literally, too, it's, by the way. literally, it's freezing out here. I'm yeah. like, no, it's just cold. It's just freezing. If it was literally freezing, yeah. you would have frostbite. That's right. Okay, so you want to tell Hoda that you're on my side? I'm on Jenna's side, Hoda. Stop with the literally. Thank you. It's not a book <laughs> to begin with. Yeah, if we want to talk literal, yeah. let's go to talk Jane Austen. You yeah. know what I mean? You go away from New York for a couple months. What's the first thing you do when you come back? Just walk. A walk in New York is like reading a novel. The, you see snippets of, you know what I love? That people yap on the phone out loud. I love hearing half a conversation. I you do know? too. I, it's fun, right? I yeah. don't find it annoying. No, I, really I don't like find it. it annoying. In fact, when we go to restaurants, I'm like, honey, they're getting divorced. He's like, can you pay attention to me? Yeah. It's hard not to. Musical artist that you listen to that would surprise some people. Do you like music? I love music. That would surprise some people. Yeah. Um, I don't know if it would surprise them. I really love John Denver. That's not a surprise. I, don't I think. love uh, America. I love the band America. I, and I really love uh, Malo, who they had a song called Suavecito, which is my favorite song. <laughs> is it really? Suavecito. Can you sing a little bit of Suavecito mm. to me? La, 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 <laughs> la, la, la. Sound familiar? <laughs> You know this song, Jenna, you know Suave this song. Suavecito? You know Suavecito. You don't know that you know it. It's one of the greatest Latin Suavecito. Song. Yeah. Is that it? No. I'm thinking Despac Despacito. It's not Despacito. Do you know Despacito by yes. the Bieber? Yes, Despacito no, no. es Suavecito. <laughs> okay. okay. It's um, diferente. So I felt like I needed to say, hello. Is that better? Right. No. Is it what? Was that better? Hello. Hello. Okay. Is that, what's the number one Seinfeld line that people yell at you and when you're walking the streets? Um, they yell, um, where's Kramer a lot. I don't know why I'm expected to be with him at all times. They yell, where's Kramer? What do you say? I go, he's not real. <laughs> he's not real. Um, uh, this is sort of a strange one, but last picture you took on your iPhone. I hope, it, only if it's, in a, if it's not appropriate. It's always, of course, I don't do anything okay. appropriate. Okay, the last picture I took, well, it's a, it's a small story. Okay, we've got the time, as long okay. as you do. I like, I like, uh, I watch a lot of YouTube. I like funny uh, pet stuff. Yeah, and I, saw I know you do. And I saw a bulldog <laughs> riding a skateboard. Uh, and it was so cute, and I was so fascinated, and I just thought that they just showed how this bulldog, he just loves his skateboard, he loves it, and I go, that, that's, that explains so much of life right there. He just, he just loves it. And there's no reason why. No one will ever understand why. He loves that skateboard. So later on that day, I was walking from 69th in New York to Columbus and 81st, and as I was getting up to Columbus on 81st, I saw a bulldog no. and a woman, same day, a woman carrying his skateboard. Was it the same bulldog? No. And did you take a picture yes. of it? Yes. And did you send it to your wife? No. Okay. I thought maybe you'd share it. I know she likes funny pet I videos too. I told the story. The picture wasn't great. <laughs> a little blurry. Yeah, but it was amazing. So I just have to go back to the fact that you like funny pet videos. Do you find comfort in them, humor, what is it? I don't, uh, I don't really have a pet. I don't, I know. You do we, have a pet, I'm you not, have Javier. It's, I'm, I'm not, it's not, he and I have no real relationship. Wait, that's, your wife is gonna take real offense to this. No, it's her thing. You don't like cats? They're okay. <laughs> but Javier is marrying my sister's cat. That's fine. You're not gonna be at the wedding? I guess I will. <laughs> you don't really like a cat. I, I like that my wife enjoys it. Okay. And when he gets lost, I go looking for him. Well, that, Javier does not go outside on the streets of New York, does he? No, but out, we have a house in Long okay. Island, and sometimes he will escape. Okay, well, that's nice. So you yeah. do secretly love the cat? Okay, secretly. Okay, I thought Let's so. Let's keep it a secret. All right, don't tell anybody. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. It's a can't-miss summer on today. Ah! 
they are walking strong. Elegant and pretty easy to prepare. How to cut costs on your vacation. Vicki has the answers. Every single thing you need for the best summer yet. Only on Today. Mr. Secretary, when is this going to get better? You came into this job saying you were to fight crime. Have you been successful? Found a way to put that. Can you update us on the status of negotiations? Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. And what do you love about fatherhood? The chaos, the learning. Is climate change one of your top priorities? What's your message to girls who want to make a difference in their own communities? Believe in yourself. Excuse me, uh, I think you forgot my bread. Bread, two dollars extra. Two dollars, but everyone in front of me got free bread. You want bread? Yes, please. Three dollars! <laughs> what? No soup for you! You want bread? Three dollars! No soup for you! How would I describe the soup Nazi? Is I just thought he was a very militant food vendor who, who didn't take crap from anybody and uh, ruled his his soup station with an iron fist. And I, I even went into the original audition in an army uniform with a beret. So I looked like uh, Saddam Hussein. <laughs> You're pushing your luck, little man. Sheila! Hey! Uh-oh. What is this? You're kissing in my line? Nobody kisses in my line! My favorite line is the kissing line, and uh, I was doing a, a thing for Sony once called the Seinfeld Food Truck, where we were going to different locations, and for two hours people would line up and get treats. And uh, I very seldom get the chance to say that line, and there was one couple in Albuquerque, New Mexico, who were brave enough to stand there and start making out in front of me, and I finally got to say, like, you're kissing in my line? Nobody kisses in my line! The main thing is to keep the line moving. I say, you hold out your money, speak your soup in a loud, clear voice, step to the left and receive. So, right. The step to the left part, it, it's, it's been made fun of so often. I've had people come up to me and like, stand like that and step to the left. And uh, going to the actual real soup stand, I finally found out that the reason you step to the left is the menu board is to your right. So if you order and stay there, no one else could see the menu. So there actually is method to the madness. I actually say no soup for you a lot these days, but uh, in the first like three years after the episode, I refused to say it. I wouldn't say it for anybody. I, uh, when I was nominated for the Emmy, I had interviews with a, a few big TV shows and I refused to say it for them because I just thought I'd sound like a bad water cooler impression of myself out of context. And then when we shot the finale, um, the very first scene we shot was actually a silent scene at this bed and breakfast where I take Poppy's soup bowl away from him because he motions that he wants salt and pepper. <laughs> and uh, Jerry and Larry David decided that I should say no soup for you out loud, even though you weren't going to hear it in the show, which absolutely terrorized me but I said it and as we walked away from that scene Larry David walked over to me and goes hey man you say it the same way you said it three years ago so ever since then it's like a knee jerk there was um, a lady named Marcia who was in the extra pool and they had built the soup stand a little longer than they planned so for me to go to the cash register and back to serve the soup was killing the timing of the lines. It was just taking too long. So they called this girl out from the extra pool because she looked like she would be working in, in my stand. And uh, her name was Marcia. And she, at a moment's notice, did that thing where she pulls the bag away from George and hands him the money back. It actually got uh, more laughs than anything I did. And to this day, 
When I see that scene over and over again, I laugh at her timing. The guy who runs the place is a little temperamental, especially about the ordering procedure. He's secretly referred to as the soup Nazi. Working with that cast was just amazing. Jason Alexander was calling me Lat, which is the New York shortening of Larry. There's Lawrence, Larry, Lat, but that's New York. And he was calling me that within about an hour of me being on the set. Um, Julia was incredible because if I made her laugh, she would totally break up and she'd grab my hand and go, you're so funny. So they were so welcoming. But the most amazing story to me is Jerry himself because um, I've dealt with a lot of producers and directors in the world of theater, TV, film, everything. I've done some directing myself and I know what that's like. But I've never worked with um, a, a director and producer who had less ego than Jerry Seinfeld. Medium crab bisque. When I did the callback, I did the six scenes that the Soup Nazi has, and he laughed a lot. It was great. It was, he was laughing too much, actually. And then he had me do it again, and he said, you know, I don't understand why the character is so mean. Could you, you know, kind of do it again and give it some of this, be a little nicer sometimes? Which I did horribly. I don't think he laughed once. And I thought for sure that was, you know, the death nail about the character. I wasn't going to get it. But I did get it. And as soon as I walked onto the soundstage, Jerry B. lined over to me and he said, you know what, man, forget about the direction I gave you. Just do what you did when you walked in. The meaner, the funnier, I guess. And I was just astounded by his lack of wanting to be right, which almost every other director and producer uh, has. I could go a long time without being recognized, but every once in a while, somebody will say to me, you know, has anybody ever told you you look like the soup Nazi from Seinfeld? And depending on if I have time to talk about it, you know, because sometimes I, like I'm in a rush or something, so I'll just say like, yeah, I get that a lot. And other times, you know, I, I get to go like, yeah, I was him. You know, and it's, it's always fun because Seinfeld fans uh, range from 13 years old to, to 83 years old, you know. A couple of times I've been somewhere, like on the subway, or somewhere where it's crowded and people can't really see me. And I will actually hear somebody say to somebody else, you know, no soup for you. And I'm, I'm actually like, you know, 10 people away and they don't even know that I'm there, but I hear people say it. I actually wrote a book called Confessions of a Soup Nazi, an adventure in acting and cooking, uh, which is part cookbook, part memoirs of, you know, 30, 40 years of being an actor. But the reason I wrote it is because I get so many people that come up to me and they go, you know, you were so great on Seinfeld. Did you ever do any other acting after that? So, uh, I, but I get all kinds of stuff. I get people that, that think I'm really Al Yegane and that's, you know, I, I was at your soup stand. I visited New York and I was at your soup stand and, you know, it was closed. When do you plan on reopening? I have so much fun with going, like, I'm, I'm an actor. It's not my soup stand. It's, you know. The funniest thing about how my life has changed after Seinfeld is I had no idea that the life I had was gone forever. Not a moment goes by in my life where it doesn't have something to do with having been the soup Nazi. Really, an hour goes by and something happens where that takes over my life again. So it's, it's a whole new existence. Where do I think the Soup Nazi would be now? Well, then I have to pitch my idea for a spinoff because, see, I, I see a food court in Manhattan where the Soup Nazi, Babu, and Poppy are all in a row with their prospective little stands, and Jackie Childs comes in there every day for lunch and we vie for his business, of course. You know, whatever the storylines are about, uh, or whatever actually the events that happen in every episode, it really boils down to the way people treat each other. You know, they didn't treat people very well. You gotta admit that. I know people loved, you know, Jerry, George, Elaine, and Kramer, but they were horrible. They treated people badly, and they always got their comeuppance for treating people badly. So. I guess in the end, that's such a generational and universal, never-ending idea is 
you treat people a certain way and you get back the way, you know, it's like the golden rule, you know, you get back what you give. And that's really what the show is about in the Hello there to all of you watching Today All Day. I'm Joe Fryer filling in for Carson for today's Pop Star Plus. We have a great show for you, including WWE superstar Roman Reigns' visit to the third hour ahead of SummerSlam. Plus, our conversation with the cast of The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel. They're celebrating 12 Emmy nominations this year. And to close out the show, we're diving into the beloved film Practical Magic with its star Sandra Bullock. A glimpse at the leading lady from the 90s you have to see. But first, here's today's pop start with Chanel. All right, first up, Jeopardy. It's an announcement audiences have been waiting for nearly two years to hear what is a permanent new host, or actually two. Well, according to Deadline, the iconic game show plans to continue splitting hosting duties between Maya Bialik and Ken Jennings into the next season. Jeopardy is reportedly in talks to extend the two-host format with the current lineup in two long-term deals, and production has been teasing this one for a while. So just last month, executive producer Michael Davis so variety the show was going to need quote multiple hosts for the franchise's expanded future plans okay interesting well, i mess with the i'm looking at you like you might have some insights i have no insight. i was going to say someone who once hosted yeah, yeah some say maybe the best host ever oh, yeah. stop. some say <laughs> that that is, is it, my mother says that that's 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 is it, it harder than most people think doing it is very yeah. hard it's yeah. a challenging job it moves so fast right. well, it's not go. about that you have to know the answers because those are written down right it's just more you got to move fast and you don't want to mess up the game no true because then you've ruined the contestant Especially the fans, like they're all about oh, it. Oh, yes, the fans are, they have yeah. opinions. <laughs> yeah. Okay, all right. Well, I was I, not their choice. So congratulations to the two of them. <laughs> Next up, Britney Spears and Sir Elton John, the two music giants, are reportedly teaming up on a new project. How does a remake of Tiny Dancer sound? Wow. According to People Magazine, a source confirmed Britney and Elton are recording a duet of the 1972 classic, and the track could be released as early as next month. This would mark Britney's first new music since 2016 in her big return to the recording studio after the end of her 13 long year long conservatorship fans online as you can imagine yesterday blew up twitter with excitement one sharing this gif and writing this is perfect britney is literally a tiny dancer <laughs> another adding and suddenly the world was at peace again <laughs> but of course with all the excitement come the many internet sleuth theories so a lot of folks pointing to a now deleted video of brit hanging out with rocker rocket man actor taryn edgerton as a sign that she might have been recording with Elton this past weekend. He lives mm. close by. Neither Britney or Elton have confirmed the news yet, so you'll just have to keep it here to today and we'll keep you posted. All right, next up, Adele. Rumor has it. Do you get it? Yeah. I got it. Okay. There's a good reason for fans to celebrate this morning. The Grammy winner is finally headed to Vegas. You might recall Adele abruptly canceled her residency in Vegas back in January, just one day before it was scheduled to kick off, citing COVID as a reason for production delays. But now she says they figured out the logistics and she's ready to rock. Yesterday, she announced the rescheduled Caesars Palace shows titled Weekends with Adele will run from November to March. Online, the singer thanked her fans for their patience, writing in a post, I'm going to give you the absolute best of me. It's nice to say. Mm -hmm. Tickets will go on sale next month. Adele's website says fans who had tickets for the original shows will get priority when that opens up. So that's fair. All right, next up, a league of their own. There's no crying in baseball, but there is cheering in Studio 1A because we have an exclusive sneak peek at the new full-length trailer for Prime Video's upcoming series, nearly three decades in the making. So let me set it up. It's based on Penny Marshall's 1992 hit movie. It will feature real life events from the 1940s in and outside of the famous All-American Girls Professional Baseball League. All right, here's a look. We're here for the tryouts. I don't think you understand. This is the All-American League. We're pretty All-American. Who was that? Show that knuckleball. They didn't even let me try out, Dad. Maxine, you've got to make some smarter choices. This is fun. This is something I can work with. Teachers, I'd like to go through a few rules. Curfew is at 10 p.m. sharp. No smoking or drinking. No pants. What? <laughs> if you want the game to be more exciting, shorten the skirts. Yeah. What the hell are you doing? I thought that you would catch it. My back turn? This is our 
one. Okay, yes. there you go. It's going to be good rounding out that all-star lineup. The ensemble cast is led by Abby Jacobson, Nick Offerman, and Shante Adams. A League of Their Own premieres Friday, August mm -hmm. 12th on Prime Video. All right, and finally, Lady Gaga. Fans are saying the pop superstar Okay, work with me here. Has an invisible shield protecting her after this video from a recent concert went viral. You want to see it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, so watch as Gaga's performing. Something appears to fly towards the stage. You see it there? Then bam. Whoa. The dark object just stops unexpectedly well, and falls to the let's ground. See it again. Look, it stops there. Looks like an iPad. And Gaga, yeah. Gaga doesn't lose her poker face for a second. Well, look, can we see but, it again? Did it's you see that? Gravity. But why did it stop it, right it, like, in that it moment? It seemed like an abrupt stop. Right? Like, okay. it looks like it hit her shield. It, it, an invisible <laughs> well, shield. That's, that's what, what I was going to say. That's what the fans say. <laughs> like you said, fans know everything, right? <laughs> I see what you mean, because it didn't, but it like, stopped. fully stop. Right. It right. It hit something The fans were like, back. it went like this and then dropped. I like, I like Savannah. <laughs> it's gravity. Yeah. <laughs> no, but when I look yeah. closer now, I get it. It's an yeah. invisible shield. That's what the fans say. If the fans say she has a shield, then she does. And there's more to know today. After all, this is Pop Star Plus. First up, Joseph Quinn. Did you know the Stranger Things actor is British? Yeah, Quinn, who has become an online sensation since his character Eddie Munson joined the Hawkins gang this season, he stopped by The Tonight Show and shocked Jimmy Fallon with his accent. So Jimmy decided to put him to the test and challenge Joseph to read an Eddie monologue in voices from around the world. We're players of freaks because we like to play a fantasy game. <laughs> yeah, that's a double, a double right. point for that. All right. Okay. Liverpool. Okay. Liverpool. But, but as long as you're into bands <laughs> or science or parties. That's a good one. My, my mom's from Liverpool and she sounds exactly like that. Oh, New York. New York. New York. Oh! It's fun, it's good for a minute. Oh! Dear Duffer Brothers, we're going to join the campaign to bring Eddie back for season five. All right, and finally, Andy Cohen, the TV host and father of two, is adding singer to his resume. Yesterday, Cohen posted a video showing off his pipes for an audience of, well, his 12-week-old daughter, Lucy. And in typical Andy Cohen fashion, it's not your average lullaby. Look out, look out, the candy man. Here he comes and he's gone again. Little lady ain't got no friends to my candy man. Again. Who knew babies love Grateful Dead? Yeah, Lucy's face there says it all. Those are your Pop Star Plus headlines. Still to come, Roman Reigns tells us what could be in store at WWE SummerSlam. And what do you love about fatherhood? The chaos, the learning. Is climate change one of your top priorities? What's your message to girls who want to make a difference in their own communities? Believe in yourself. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Live from Ukraine, from Uvalde, Texas, from Mayfield, Kentucky. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. You can actually see they're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No, do you remember any tornado as bad as this one? You look at this and you're thinking, we're not going to have power for weeks, if not months. Exactly. Every night. It's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. This is a critical choke point for this fire. And good evening from New Orleans. Nice to really spend some time with you. Appreciate it. Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Welcome back to Pop Star Plus. Roman Reigns is the WWE's undisputed Universal Champion, and he's set to take on fellow WWE star and my fellow Minnesotan Brock Lesnar at SummerSlam 2022. Last year's event drew record breaking viewership, and Roman told our third hour all about this year's hype. 
WWE superstar has won multiple championships in the ring. And outside of the ring, he has beat cancer twice. Yeah. This weekend, yeah. we are going to see him in fight mode as he faces off against Brock Lesnar at the WWE Super Slam. Good morning. Welcome back, Ooh. Roman. Hi. Good morning, guys. Morning. Thanks for having me. Yes. It's so great to see you. So, I'm pretty sure at WrestleMania 38, you beat Brock Lesnar, and now you're going to go back to Nashville. You're going to face off against him again at Super Slam. How are you feeling? Uh, SummerSlam. Season. SummerSlam. There we go. I, I feel great. You know, uh, I'm on a course now to do something that no one's ever done dominate Brock Lesnar so, <laughs> you know and we're really entering that that kind of time frame in my career where I'm really pushing myself to a different level and, and just trying to achieve things that have never been done before and anytime you can beat Brock Lesnar you know three times in a row that's a pretty, good, pretty uh, good. That's a feather in the cap. It's crazy. Yeah. I was just about to ask you about that because fans recognize that it could be the last time that we see this pairing and people want to know or they're wondering what they can expect from you. I hope it's the last time. It hurts. It's brutal. <laughs> That's being the thing. I think I would he, he's a big old country boy, and he's got uh, such a great legitimate background. I mean, he started out as an amateur wrestler right. um, all the way through the collegiate ranks into the UFC, as everybody knows, heavyweight champion. He's dominated WWE for a long time. Uh, the only problem he has is that Roman Reigns showed up and took <laughs> over. So That's awesome. it's, uh, it's going to be great. That's good. You, your work does not stop when you get home. Mm. You have five little no. ones, yeah. two sets. One set of twins. I can't even imagine. Gotcha. Two yeah. sets. Two <laughs> sets of twins. Yeah, so what is your daily life like? Well, it, it's it's loud. It's hectic. <laughs> um, it, you know, it's one of those things when you have that many kids, you really have to have a schedule and just try to get everything in line. Mm -hmm. And you're just kind of knocking it, almost treating it like a business because there's just so many of yeah. them. Um, and you have to try to delegate and give them all as much attention as possible. Uh, so it's been great. You know, my, my schedule shifted around a little bit, so I have a lot more time at home now. Yeah. And I can feel that relationship yeah. strengthening and those bonds are getting better and better. So it's, uh, it's a very blessed situation. But he did say in the break he does have date nights to get away with That's his wife manicures yeah, and pedicures got to him. admittedly <laughs> date nights date lunches you have to be creative when you have a lot of kids and you have to continue to put the work in your relationship yeah, no, so that's right. very important. do you right. see uh the wrestling bug in your kids I mean, it's a big part of my family. You know, my father, my uncle, yeah. um, you know, and their mentor, uh, you know, uh, High Chief Peter Maivia, who's Dwayne uh, Johnson, The Rock's uh, grandfather. Uh, so it, it has been, you know, something that's been involved in our family for a very long time. So I would not be surprised at all. Do you have roles? Like, I remember... <laughs> We used to, because we used to watch like WWE and SmackDown and all. We had, my friend of mine had a balcony and then a couch, like a, like a two tiered place. And we would jump off of her balcony and then jump onto the couch and like do wrestling moves. I mean, it was dangerous, I think, back now. And there was nobody to tell us no. Like, right. you know, you're Well, I'm here now to tell you this out there. We're going to take this opportunity and we're going to tell you no. Don't do that. Right? I know. Leave it up to us. I Let us it. entertain tell you. Me. Speak, don't break your bones on the couch. Don't break your bones. And I never did somehow. Really quickly, there's your video game character. How cool is that? It's awesome, yeah. It's he um, just like you. Well, they're doing a great job nowadays. 2K is done Look at unbelievable. This. Look at this. Yeah. Uh, I mean, to, to really, you know, plug it in and Oof. make it the realism and then also just the playability. You know, it, they, they made it a lot easier to uh, have fun with this game. So they've done a great job. Roman, it's so great to see you. Amazing. Yeah, it is amazing. You can watch SummerSlam on Saturday, July 30th at 8 o'clock Eastern on Peacock, part of our parent company, NBC Universal. Up next, a visit with Tony Shalhoub and his fellow marvelous Mrs. Maisel co-stars. Uvalde, Texas, a small town that has become yet another landmark. How long do you think it took for all this damage to occur? Can you tell us what, what it was like? With our NBC News exclusive. It was less
These are our missing daughters and sons. We need anyone who saw something to come forward. She was wearing a black jacket, a black top. I'm going to bring my son home alive. Dateline Missing in America. Listen now wherever you get your podcasts. Live from Ukraine, from Uvalde, Texas, from Mayfield, Kentucky. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. You can actually see they're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No. Do you remember any tornado as bad as this one? You look at this and you're thinking, we're not going to have power for weeks, if not months. Exactly. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson. Streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Welcome back to Pop Start Plus. We love catching up with the stars of the marvelous Mrs. Maisel. It racked up, count them, 12 Emmy nominations this year, including one for Tony Shalhoub in his role as Abe Weissman. He and the rest of the cast, who play parents on the show, spoke to us about what they love the most about their characters. It's been a, a big, big transitional period for Abe. He's let go of his conventional life and stable career. This season really develops his whole period of kind of reinventing himself. On the positive side, in a way, it brings him closer, I think, to Midge because her life is, uh, you know, she's gotten bounced off the, the tour and she's forced to start over too. So. In a way, there's a, there's an intersection of, of, their, of their paths. Rose's journeys have been so thrilling and so um, surprising to me as an actor. So as we know, she started this show with this judgment about what was happening with her child and definitely felt like she understood or thought she understood exactly how the, the world was supposed to work. And I love how all of that, you know, it was combusted and completely turned upside down by what happened with this divorce. So I think what's great about season four is we're going to see everything that she trusted at one point is gone and she's got a new or a job. And so we see a businesswoman really coming into, in, into her own, which, by the way, is not unlike her child. You know, Apple, like... Apple never really seemed to fall that far from tree, but now like the tree is like being taken care of by the apple. So that's kind of beautiful. What can we expect from Shirley in season four is more Shirley. Shirley, Shirley is always Shirley. Um, her driving passion is her family. She is concerned that her son is single. Um, she wants everybody to be settled and happy and well-fed. And she is going to go to the ends of the earth to make sure that that's true. I think uh, that Moish will forever be rooting for Midge and Joel to get back together while magically maintaining relationships with each, but perhaps that's part of his uh, not so evil plan to get them back together by being involved in both of their lives. I think that's Moish's plan for season four. Probably not your cup of tea, though, right, eh? Bye bye, Birdie. I know nothing about the show, Moish. Yes, but I know you. And I know you wouldn't like Bye Bye Birdie because Bye Bye Birdie is entertaining. I know nothing about the show. They have a very complicated relationship, these two. They're, they're, uh, they are very different. On the other hand, they're kind of more similar in some ways than they would even want to ever want to admit. They're tied together. They're family. They're, even though their children are separated and, and divorced, they share grandchildren. And they're forever, they're forever, you know, bonded um, for good or for ill. Um, yeah, and Amy I and think Dan found a great balance also of the oil and water nature of the Weissmans and, and the Maisels as the, the patriarchs and matriarchs. Well, I have to say, I'm, I'm like madly in love with Caroline. So when we work together, it's hard to be at odds. It's always been weird for me to be an actor that has to have tension with somebody that I love so, so much, but it's also so much fun because there's so much trust. So that when we had that scene running out, you know, where I ran out of her house and just screamed and yelled in the neighborhood, that was one of my most fun moments of work. So fun. Shut up! You shut up! You shut up! Both of you shut up! Shirley! Oh, God. 
Rose, you scared me. What is the matter with you? We have neighbors. And right now they're all looking at you like you're insane. And therefore they're looking at me like I'm insane because I live here with you in this house. I think one of the most enjoyable and challenging aspects of working on The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel is the style uh, of the eight page wonder, as uh, it's called. That is to say that there's an eight page scene that it's normally cut up into anywhere from 20 to 40 pieces of coverage. Hey! Oh my oh God. God. What is it? It's your car is blocking mine. My car. Get up, you gotta move it. What time is it? It's four after five. Four after five in the morning. And I'm late. Come on, get a move on. Oh, my leg is asleep. You both wear pajamas? What are your girlfriends? Oh, my slippers. Cheryl and me, we sleep in the buff. It's healthier, freer, warmer, too. Where did I put my robe? Skin on skin as God intended. Come on! Chop, chop! Oh, yeah. You know, as an actor, to be challenged by that is not something I'd experienced before. But this style of acting is not something I uh, was was uh, prepared for and have absolutely loved to learn how to do. Rose, <laughs> it's laundry day. A Bob, laundry day. It's five in the morning. Her purity, her authenticity, her mm-hmm. lack of shame. It's something that is so freeing. Marin and I talk about this a lot, that these characters give us a chance to exercise freedoms that we don't necessarily personally possess. Um, Marin has talked to me a lot about Rose's confidence that she is trying to access inside of herself. And I feel the same way about Shirley. Shirley has no shame. She is all embracing. She's all heart and she's completely authentic. There is no filter between what she thinks and what she says, which I love. Moish, could you come down here, please? Sure, Shirley, this is completely unnecessary. Moisha! Shirley! Someone's in trouble. Shut up, Alan. Moishi! Yeah! Can you come down here, please? Shirley, I assure you. Moish! I'm not wearing pants. I need to ask you something. You can't ask me from there? No. Do I need to put on pants? Yes! All right. I delight in, in playing this character. Uh, I'm a father myself uh, of two daughters that are uh, similar age to Midge. And there's a, a lot of overlap there. Uh, it's, I guess the best, the most fun for, for me is, is when we, we do these large group scenes, uh, the family, both families together, uh, try, you know, hammering out their their issues. We're a cast that's very tightly knit and we we all delight in playing off of each other. It's forever challenging, but it's super rewarding. The same tradition of our, the show's creators, writers, directors, Amy and Dan Palladino, to expand the universe, to drive Midge's character forward in her ambitious attempts to gain control of her own career and life on her terms. Um, All the relationships expanding, new characters introduced, that tradition season after season will continue and if you like that sort of thing and you can lower your expectations you're up for a great ride (laughs) always great to hear from that accomplished cast you can catch the marvelous mrs mazel on prime video still to come a little practical magic with the one and only sandra bullock travel back to the 90s with us next today is now a podcast available every morning listen wherever you get your podcasts the midterms are here It's time to plan your vote. We'll provide everything you need to know to successfully cast your ballot. Just select any state you want to learn about for the primary or general election, and you'll instantly get voting rules, see the next big deadline, and learn how to take action for your plan. Voting rules have changed since 2020, and those rules vary from state to state. So it's time to get planning for 2022. Visit NBCNews.com slash plan your vote today. Welcome back to you today. We've got a lot to celebrate yes. on this Wednesday morning. It's good to have you along with us. You don't know when your moment's coming, but when it does, you take it. Everybody's good, and that's it! Yeah. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. These are our missing daughters and sons. We need anyone who saw something to come forward. She was wearing a black jacket, a black top. I'm going to bring my son home alive. Dateline Missing in America. Listen now wherever you get your podcasts. Today is now a podcast. Available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Hallie Jackson Now. Weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now.
We are back. Sandra Bullock is one of Hollywood's most beloved stars, and today she's celebrating a birthday. So in her honor, we're going to take a fun trip down memory lane, flashing back to 1998, when she told today about her bewitching role in Practical Magic. Sandra Bullock, good morning. Welcome morning. back. Thank you. Nice to see you. Nice to be here. All right, how does one describe this this movie? That's I, a good question. You want to hear how I describe it? <laughs> yeah, okay, it? please. Okay, <laughs> a romantic comedy <laughs> with a little Stephen King and Thelma and Louise thrown in for good measure. I'll, I'll live with that. That's, a, that's good. That's you really think? good. You good. Good job. Okay, you're done. Thanks very <laughs> much. <Andrew. laughs> Bye. <laughs> just kidding. What do you? I mean, it's it's. I mean, is 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 odd as that sounds. That's essentially what the book was. And so instead of us saying, let's try and find one tone that'll sort of generalize things, it, it we just wanted to be experimental and stay true to the fact that there were several different feelings, which, you know, pisses some people off and is confusing. Can you say that? On well, a ticks would be okay. preferable, but we Upsets, can live with that. You know, it, it, it's a, because we're used to having just one tone, and I think the fact that this has several tones um, sets people back a little bit. But once you get into it, you go, okay, a little something for everybody. Because which, it really does kind of dip into very yeah. light, funny moments, and then very dark, yeah, scary yeah. moments. But you're like, whoa, wait well, a minute. I think the scary side makes the funnier parts funnier and I think the funnier parts makes you when you get to you need the relief on either side I think and that's what I liked so much about it was that just when you think you know what you're getting you don't kind of like the witches you think you're getting one side but you know yeah you it, it, and you guys are the two sisters yeah. are you and Nicole Kidman mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you play Sally she mm -hmm. plays Jillian mm -hmm. and you're sort of a yin and yang type uh, yeah, sister act, right? It's sort of like what happened to my sister and myself. There are no genes that were replicated. <laughs> they just sort of split and we went our separate ways, which is incredibly healthy once you get older and you really learn to love and appreciate what makes them different and you know that if you were the same, you'd kill each other. Um, and that's what I liked about this was that, that Jillian and myself, Nicole and myself, were so completely different in real life as we are in the, in the film that you just... You see other ways of looking at things because we get so comfortable in how we do things all the time that to have someone who's completely opposite show you, well, why don't you try it this way, is such a relief. I can't even tell you. Did you like working with Nicole I had Kidman? such a great time. I had you such a great time. You guys really hit it off, didn't you? We did. And the fact is, is that we don't have anything in common except for at the dinner table with a bottle of wine and everything sort of blends together. Speaking at the dinner table with yeah. a bottle of wine, yeah. you had a bottle of tequila, tequila. at yeah. the dinner table in one scene yeah. and, and the, uh, a producer on the Today Show, Peter Johansson, and I went to see it and we said, this looks like such a fun well, scene. It, this is sort of the big chill dance scene for the 90s, right? Yeah. It's, it's, it's what it's supposed to be. I mean, that, yes, that's what we would hoped it would be, but um, we weren't drunk when we shot these parts or when we did our close-ups, but then we had to reshoot a scene where it was far away and it was on our backs, and Nicole just put the bottle on the table and she says, you know what, there's no reason we shouldn't be drunk here. And I said, you know what, that's true. So we got a little... Was that as fun as it looked, though? Yeah, Even the scenes pretty... when you weren't drinking tequila, it was so fun just it... to watch you guys let loose what and go crazy. What was the most fun watching Diane and Stockard? You know, because you think you're being well, and you turn around, they're like, their shirts are practically... <laughs> Not literally, but it, it's just such, it was just such freedom. Then, of course, Griffin would run in in the scene and dance around the table. Oh, Griffin feeling a little Dunn, left who's out. the director. The director yeah. And I, we should mention Diane Wiest and Stockard, Stockard Channing, Channing play yeah. the aunts. The aunts, and Aidan Quinn plays um, the, the handsome... Cop. I think he yeah. has pretty blue it's not, eyes. It doesn't hurt to have that, I realized. Yeah, so although in, your, in this case, he has one green eye and one, one blue, blue eye, right? Eye. Because blue Sally, when she's a little girl, makes, makes a, the wish that that's the guy she wants, but she makes a list that possibly couldn't exist. We haven't really still described what, what, what happens in this movie. Should we do that a little bit to give sure. people an idea what sure, they're going into? Sure, you're so good into? at the first, you know, <laughs> list, so why don't you continue? No, go just, ahead, you do it. Oh, darn it. Just a little <laughs> bit. Just give us a quick synopsis of the plot. Well, essentially, it's, it's the, the plot is here, here to, you know, two women that have experienced or seen how love is so painful to their mother and their mother uh, basically died of a broken heart because all the Owens women are doomed to have their true love die. If, and so you basically run around with a curse knowing that if you love somebody, they really love you, they're going to die. Which is, is we, I know when I really find that happiness, I go, oh my God, what's going to happen to them? You know, it's, I think that's the same thing with ha ha having children that sh my character limits herself from ever feeling that again. And Nicole's character goes off and experiences it to excess. You right. Know, She's this like wild herself. biker oh, yeah. chick, exactly. crazy, insane girl. Yeah, exactly. And finds the one guy that's essentially not great for her, but she doesn't feel like he's going to die. And so it's, it's those fears that we all live through. And also the fact is, do, are we ever going to find that amazing person that's right for us? Would you call this a chick flick? You know what? Yeah, I would. 
I would. And it's 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 got it's it doesn't eliminate anything for the guys, but it definitely the women come out of a feeling and that's what I loved about it is that I didn't want to have a film where I'm killing the other girl for her man or stealing her husband or or not supporting those people that I really love that happen to be female. Well, we're spellbound over you, Sandra. Happy birthday. There you go, folks. Another Pop Star Plus for you. Join us again tomorrow. Until then, bye. Hi, hi, hi. Today All Day is here. This is our digital show. It's called Today in 30. It's our half hour wrap up of everything from our show this morning. And we're going to start with the nation's economy. All eyes on the Fed's key meetings getting underway today to try to control uh, record inflation. Tom Costello is right there. He'll have a lot more coming up. Then we're going to bring you a story about adorable panda bears. <laughs> but this has a high tech twist. Your first look at facial recognition technology that's being developed to protect them in the wild. Look at that. Also, Ed, we're so excited to introduce you to this remarkable teenager, a 16-year-old. He just spent 28 days sailing across the Atlantic by himself. He joined us for an exclusive interview to talk about his incredible feat. All that plus today contributor Alejandro Ramos is here with some great tips to help you pick the perfect produce at the farmer's market. So let's get to it. Coming up on Today, today in 30. 30. NBC's Tom Costello is at the Fed headquarters in D.C., back on Fed Watch, and he's outside the Federal Reserve in Washington with the latest. Hey, Tom, good morning. Hey, Hoda, good morning to you. So the Fed has made it very clear it intends to keep raising interest rates to get inflation under control. It's walking a real tightrope here. It needs to slow the economy without pushing it over a cliff. We're going to find out this week whether despite 50-year unemployment lows, the economy is already right on the edge. Mid-July and the economic heat is on. The key question, has the economy already slid into recession, shrinking two quarters in a row? President Biden remains optimistic. God willing, I don't think we're going to see a recession. The fear the Federal Reserve could push the economy into recession, as it's expected to again raise interest rates another three quarters of a percentage point on Wednesday to curb 40-year high inflation. The latest inflation report showed no sign of relief, up 9.1% in June. Americans are paying more for rent, food, clothing, and fuel, though gas prices have dropped 68 cents in a month. They're still $1.17 more than a year ago. Instead of maybe just running to the supermarket like two and three times per week, I'm more conscious about trying to get everything in one trip. The Fed chairman has insisted the price hikes are not sustainable. We at the Fed understand the hardship that high inflation is causing. We're strongly committed to bringing inflation back down. Late Monday, more evidence of the inflation effect as retail giant Walmart said Americans are changing what they buy. More groceries, fewer big ticket items. A recent survey found 58% of Americans are living paycheck to paycheck. For some, it's impossible to make ends meet. Food banks are reporting a surge of people in need from California. Diapers are so expensive now, and um, I recently just had twins. To Virginia. Their rents are up. Their transportation costs are up. They have to fill their tanks to get to work. And the thing that's giving is that food budget. Underscoring the Fed's challenge. How much pressure is the Fed under right now to get this economy back to an even keel? They need to get it right this time, and the, the, the danger here is they really get it wrong a second time. After uh, uh, providing too much stimulus to the economy, now they're going to take it away too quickly and perhaps create a recession. Yeah, we've said all along that when you, when you hike interest rates, of course, you could see credit cards get more expensive, car loans, new loans, and also mortgages are influenced by what the Fed does. So a lot riding on these higher rates. Hold it back to you. But Tom, then you go to what President Biden said yesterday, and he said he does not expect a recession. So what's driving that optimism? I gotta say he's not the only one. Economists are divided because this is a head scratcher of an economy. Never before has the Fed been in an environment where it's trying to fight inflation. Despite very low unemployment, wages keep going up, consumers still spend. In addition, we're coming out of a pandemic with massive amounts of stimulus money to keep the economy from going into a depression. So this is a very, very unusual uh, predicament for the Fed right now. And whether we're in a recession or not may not be defined 
by simply two quarters of contracting GDP. All right, Tom Costello for us there at the Fed in D.C. Tom, thanks. And this morning, a high-tech new way of protecting pandas. And here to bring it to us, NBC's Janice Mackey Frere. Janice, we were just, we're so excited to see you. <laughs> pandas are too, you, but you're our Beijing correspondent. We have not seen you since yeah. the pandemic. It's great to have you here. Oh, it's fantastic to be here. <laughs> Thanks for having you. me. And everybody loves panda bears. Uh -huh. yeah. uh, and now facial recognition is being used to track these adorable creatures, both in captivity and in the wild. And we recently visited the Chengdu Research Base of Giant Panda Breeding. It's in Southwest China to see how it works. Giant pandas are revered around the world, and most of them live here in China. About 1,800 are in the wild, and more than 600 in captivity, where they have a rock star sort of popularity. It's very cute and lovely. They look adorable, and pretty much everything they do is cute. There's a mother and baby here. But to the human eye, telling those furry faces apart, well, it's not so black and white. To know which panda might be Bebe, or Aichio, or Baoli. Is this the same panda? No. Nope. A different one? Same. Different one, yeah. Uh -huh. And so researchers at the Chengdu Panda Base are looking deeper, developing facial recognition technology for pandas. Chan Peng is the researcher behind a growing database of panda images and videos that computers analyze to detect slight differences in how they look. Their mouth, nose, markings and ears, he says. We can distinguish their features through deep learning. Being able to recognize each bear can help with conservation, experts say, because they can know panda populations better, their habitats, health, and how they live. In the wild, where two-thirds of the world's giant pandas roam, hundreds of remote and infrared cameras can also watch for threats. Using artificial intelligence for pandas is different from AI that's used on humans, and nowhere more than here in China, because pandas are covered in fur and don't really have facial expressions beyond this or this or this. The pandas are most active in the morning before it gets too hot. Then they just want to go inside and sleep. Getting a panda's portrait isn't easy. It can take hours for photographers to get usable images, including of pandas living at zoos in the U.S. Soon, panda fans here will be able to use their phones to scan their favorite faces and get details about who's who. They have lovely ears and little feet, she says. While giant pandas are no longer classed as endangered, they are still vulnerable. AI could ensure they're better protected, or at least never called by the wrong name. <laughs> Cute. So sweet. Wow, oh, wow, incredible that they're able to use this technology, because honestly, they do look yeah. all the same to me. Yeah. Well, but the app is going to be able to help people visiting uh, zoos and the panda research base to be able to identify who their favorite is. Like, oh, that's Doo Doo. Or, <laughs> yeah. It, well, we're so awesome. happy you're here in the studio. Every time we look at you, we remember the moment where you hadn't seen your son because you were working covering COVID in China for 49 days. It was this oh. moment. No. And oh. not only is this moment poignant because we loved seeing it, Oh. But also because today it's his ninth birthday. It's his ninth birthday. Oh. What's it's his name? Nice. His name is Jet. Oh. Jet, and he's uh, he's in Canada right yeah. now visiting his grandma, oh. who he hasn't oh. seen since the, the beginning of the pandemic. Wow. So, well, it's gonna yeah. happy, happy birthday, We're Jet. Happy. Thank yes. you. <laughs> What's it like being here right now? Yeah. It's very strange. Um, you know, we live in China. They have the zero COVID policy, mm -hmm. so there are a lot of rules and a lot of restrictions. Um, on the flight to Vancouver, mm -hmm. the flight crew was in the full white suits with the wow. goggles and kept them on for 12 hours. So the, it's it's very strange to go from a place where the restrictions are taken to mm -hmm. an extreme. Mm -hmm. You know, into a world <laughs> walk right here. They're like, <laughs> here it is. A little yeah. bit from COVID. We're hugging and guys. Yeah. 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 She's probably like, too yeah. soon, too soon. Yeah. Six feet, please. Yeah. Yeah. We can't keep six yeah. feet from you. We're yeah. just delighted to have you this here. This is a thanks, thrill. Thank you. Thank you. We do a little boost, guys? Yeah. Let's hit it. All right. It's pretty common for teenagers to be completely embarrassed 
when their parents do something for no apparent reason. But there is a teenager who deserves our sympathy for her dad's actions. Take a look at the scene from a California restaurant. Excuse me. My daughter thinks that you are so cute. Oh my God. Stop! <laughs> What's your... Oh, my God. 15-year-old oh Sophie God, love slid under the table after that comment. Turns out Sophie's brother was the one who gave the dad the idea. Yeah, look after at the brother. He's the brother. innocent. He's no. Trying... You know. He was like, what? Oh. So the dad heard Sophie whisper it, and then the, then the, the son told the dad. Anyway, Sophie now says she's on high alert around her brother. She can't say anything. She can't. Oh, my God. I love that dad. That's such a dad move. It's so good. I, would do. I just love her. Oh, my God. She's like, what? could I please just disappear right now? Could I just go away? Okay. I love that. These are our missing daughters and sons. We need anyone who saw something to come forward. She was wearing a black jacket, a black top. I'm going to bring my son home alive. Dateline Missing in America. Listen now wherever you get your podcasts. And what do you love about fatherhood? The chaos, the learning. Is climate change one of your top priorities? What's your message to girls who want to make a difference in their own communities? Believe in yourself. Tonight, I interviewed Secretary of Transportation Pete Buttigieg about the ongoing delays. You seem to be pointing the finger at the airlines. They're pointing the finger back. Mr. Secretary, when is this going to get better? Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. From Brooklyn, we're next to the subway station. The state's reservoirs are alarmingly low. War will pass them by. And what do you love about fatherhood? The chaos, the learning. Is climate change one of your top priorities? What's your message to girls who want to make a difference in their own communities? Believe in yourself. story this morning of an adventurous 16 year old he just sailed across the Atlantic Ocean all by himself crazy you know what the wildest part is though Cal Courier says he only started taking sailing lessons this year in January <laughs> oh my goodness. we're gonna talk to him exclusively but first let's have a little bit more of his amazing journey 16 year old Cal Courier has been on an Excellent adventure, completing a solo journey across the Atlantic Ocean in a sailboat. Oh, my gosh. Have fun, babe. Courier beginning the trip in Marion, Massachusetts last month. I'll miss all of you. I'll miss any human. Departing on his 30-foot sailboat, the Argo. And after about 28 days alone at sea, the California teen finally reuniting with his parents in Lagos, Portugal. From start to finish, Courier ultimately traveling nearly 4,000 miles across the Atlantic. So we're heading north um, to the east of Cape Cod. While Courier grew up around boats, he only started taking sailing lessons seriously this January. But a love for the sea runs in his family. Both Courier's father and grandfather are transatlantic sailors. The teens saying they both inspired him to make the trip across the world's second largest ocean. Time is short. Life is awesome. So do awesome things right now. So in a sailboat he bought for $12,000 from 90-year-old Sandy Van Zandt. And there's this stuff that Sandy's brought over. Uh, it from the 50s? From the 50s. <laughs> he crossed the Atlantic alone. Now, Courier is likely the youngest person to ever sail solo across the Atlantic from west to east. I want to show other kids that they aren't too young to do amazing things. Just think it up. Ask for help. Make it happen. And he's doing just that, reaching this ambitious goal all before starting his junior year of high school. Wow. And Cal Courier, he joins us now live from Lagos in Portugal. Cal, before we get to everything that happened and how you're feeling, we want to know, first of all, how your parents told you it was okay <laughs> for you to do this when you just started taking lessons in January. So, um, first off, my dad is um, very adventurous, and my mom is also um, quite adventurous. And, and um, the whole brainstorming process for what I was going to do this summer happened mm. with my dad. Um, so, 
he was kind of there for me deciding I was going to do it. Um, and my mom took a little bit more convincing, but um, <laughs> after a couple long conversations and a couple long nights, uh, we convinced her that it was safe to do. Well, Cal, what was it like? Because an Atlantic crossing is yeah. not easy sailing mm -hmm. or smooth sailing, is it? Um, so regularly, the safest way is from uh, east to west. Um, there's nicer winds and less storms that way. Um, I went um, west to east, partly because I was already on the east coast and partly out of um, some level of ignorance. Um, <laughs> it, in, in this certain um, crossing, I was extremely lucky with the wind um, and with the weather. So I only actually had one rainy night and mm. um, only a couple nights of dangerously high winds. I mean, one rainy night is enough for all of us in mm. the middle of the ocean. Tell us what was the most physical or the most difficult part. I know physically it's tough. Mentally, I read at one point you're only supposed to sleep in 90 minute increments and you overslept. Yeah, so um, the physical aspect isn't all that difficult. Um, the mental aspect is definitely the hardest part by leagues. Um, the loneliness and boredom and uh, sleep deprivation are the greatest challenges that I had to deal with. Um, boredom because I uh, misplanned and didn't bring enough books or entertainment. Um, loneliness because I'm alone for 28 days, which um, isn't easy for anyone. And um, sleep deprivation because you can't sleep for very long. Um, and yeah. Cal, you know, being out there on the open ocean at night, it is some of the darkest spots on this planet. Uh, what did you learn about yourself? Um, I'd say what I learned most about myself was just how important people are to me. Mm. I've always considered myself to be somewhat of an introverted extrovert. Um, where I like to be with myself, but at the end of the day, I love people. Um, and that was reaffirmed with this. I just really missed people the whole time. So I don't think I'll do any large solo expeditions anymore. It's just it, more fun to be with people. Just to underscore something that I just, the sleeping piece of it, because when I was yeah. a teenager, we used to sleep till 10 or 11. You couldn't <laughs> drag right. yourself oh, yeah. out of bed. But I was thinking for 28 days in a row, barely sleeping and having to wake up, how did you physically do that? Um, alarms uh, mm. and um, sleeping during the day was really important, but there were a lot of days that I didn't get more than three hours of sleep. Oh, my goodness. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm sure yeah. your parents are very excited <laughs> that you're back on dry land mm -hmm. and can't wait to put their arms around you. Congratulations. What a feat. Congrats, it's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. What were we doing at 16? I, I was going to say driving to I like 7-Eleven. I like worked at Scoops. We had oh a super gosh. soaker party for <laughs> yeah. my birthday. Yeah. I don't want to say the statute of limitations hadn't run. So, <laughs> yeah, I'm going to say what I was doing at 16. <laughs> We'll meet Ukrainians who are defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. Hey, who's this? The day's biggest political stories with trusted insight now and expert analysis now. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the Press Now, streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. You open the door for so many people. I love working with people. I did not do any of this by myself. Hello! Lizzo, you put a smile on yes. every single face. It feel like Christmas and my birthday or something. <laughs> Uvalde, Texas, a small town that has become yet another landmark. How long do you think it took for all this damage to occur? Can you tell us what, what it was like? With our NBC News exclusive. Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. We'll meet Ukrainians who are defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. Hey, who's this? 
welcome back to you today. We've got a lot to celebrate yes. on this Wednesday morning. It's good to have you along with us. You don't know when your moment's coming, but when it does, you take it. Everybody good, and that's it! Yeah. Sixty seconds goes by quickly behind the scenes. <laughs> Just FYI, this morning Jill has a double. She made it for us. Two amazing entrepreneurs with thriving beauty businesses. Yeah, you're going to love this. These two women had creative and innovative ideas, and let's just say they both nailed it. Mm -hmm. O to L. First, meet Rachel Epfel Glass, founder of Glass Lab. I had been working in finance for nearly a decade when I had my first daughter. By the time I had my second, two years later, the commuting and traveling was a lot. As a working woman and a mom, I felt like manicures were an errand. When I saw a shoe shiner come into my male-dominated offices in the mornings, I'd always think, what if? So to push my idea forward, I went to Nail Tech Training School and researched the salon industry. In 2018, using my own savings, I opened the first Gloss Lab location in New York City. Gloss Lab is a water-free, hygiene-first nail salon experience. It's also membership-based, with members paying a flat rate for monthly unlimited visits with online booking, cashless payment, and quality products. Today, we have 11 locations in New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, Maryland, and DC, with openings planned in Texas, Florida, and more. And we're even launching into retail products. I'm proud to say our customers are in good hands at Gloss Lab. We love it. Yeah, and Gloss Lab has a few membership options, including a quarterly subscription for $125 a month or a mm -hmm. monthly for $135 a month with unlimited visits to the well, salon. We also have some of their products and manage your kits right here so that you could do it at home as well. But yes, some people like to get it done. And during the pandemic, mm -hmm. obviously, a lot of people got it done. Well, and home. also, too, it's like life's simple pleasure, right? It's not a billion dollars. It makes you feel good. Like, I think women just, you know, it's like cosmetics. Your bed, having yes. your nails done. Yes. All right. Yes. Next up, a woman who changed the game using her background in science to make at-home manicures quicker and more convenient. The result was dazzling. My name is Dr. Vivian Valenti. I've been a chemist for 58 years. I got my bachelor's degree in the Philippines and earned my doctorate at Penn State University in 1971. I'd serve as an assistant professor of chemistry, a research scientist, and product developer in large companies when I realized I love solving problems by creating products that may seem mundane to some, but could be life-changing for others. Since I was 18, I have been wearing nail polish, but as I got older, I never found time to go to the salon. I made it then my mission to create a polish that dries in five minutes and lasts for weeks without using skin damaging chemicals and harmful UV rays. After years of trial and error, I created a four-step system with a flexible base coat that expands and contracts with the nails. I called it Dazzle Dry and brought it to market in 2007 with nine colors. Now we have over 170 and will sell a million bottles of product this year. It's amazing to hear that Dazzle Dry is a game changer for women and that's the formula for success. Okay, so I use this in between gel manicures when I can't get to the salon. You literally put it on and it dries in five minutes, no UV light. We have some of the hottest colors here right oh, now. Wow. Tonight, I interviewed Secretary of Transportation Pete Buttigieg about the ongoing delays. You seem to be pointing the finger at the airlines. They're pointing the finger back. Mr. Secretary, when is this going to get better? The midterms are here. It's time to plan your vote. We'll provide everything you need to know to successfully cast your ballot. Just select any state you want to learn about for the primary or general election, and you'll instantly get voting rules, see the next big deadline, and learn how to take action for your plan. Voting rules have changed since 2020, and those rules vary from state to state. So it's time to get planning for 2022. Visit NBCNews.com slash plan your vote today. Uvalde, Texas, a small town that has become yet another landmark. How long do you think it took for all this damage to occur? Can you tell us what, what it was like? With our NBC News exclusive.
Now Tonight with Joshua Johnson. Streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. As they say, it's always best to eat in season. And if you're lucky, you've got a farmer's market in your very own neighborhood. But no matter where you shop, today food contributor and host of The Great American Recipe on PBS, Alejandro Ramos, can help us pick the perfect produce I mean, we were just talking about avocados. I know. Yeah. So I love that Whitney come and set me up for this. Yeah. Because yeah. we are, we are She's your opening act. She was my opening more. act. Well, Amazing. It's it can be overwhelming. In the supermarket or the farmer's but, market, you're like, I don't know what to exactly. choose. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, the supermarket, it's like, you know where stuff is. The farmer's market can be a little yeah. bit. And too I much love yet. a farmer's market. Yeah. I yeah. mean, it's so fun. And so here's, our, here's some side, some ideas to help you kind of get the most of it. Yeah, and why, because but, it is peak season now, why right? Like, now's the best time. Why do you suggest people go to the farmer's market? Well, here's the thing. You're going to get things that are local. You're going to get things that are the freshest things possible, season, right? right? When they get to the supermarket, there's a middleman there. Okay, yeah. Here you're getting it okay, right from awesome. the farmers. Okay. So we're going to talk about first about how to how to pick out an avocado okay. uh, or a peach or anything like that. So when you want, when you go to the market, you want to get some things that are ripe and some that are less ripe mm -hmm. because you want to space them out so everything doesn't have to get used up right away. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. Right? So you want to pick them up. You want to use your senses. You want sight, smell, uh, touch. Mm -hmm. You want to feel a little bit of softness when you press like right by the root mm -hmm. there. Do you see how that gives? That's beautiful. Yeah. That's a beautiful ripe peach ready to eat. This one, well actually this one's ripe too, but then they're a little bit yeah, harder. Hard. Exactly. Same I like with avocados. A peach you can eat over a sink. It's so exactly. drippy and ripe. With your greens, I oh, I mean, yeah, that's yeah. the best. Or mango. I good. love the juice. Okay. With your greens, you want them to be fresh. You want them to kind of be like sort of taut, standing up, crisp. You don't want them wilted. Wilty on the side. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. Okay. And now keep in mind, you know, throughout the country, seasonality varies. Yeah. So right. there's wherever you are. Find out what's best in your neighborhood, in mm -hmm. your area, so you can so get, you like... So you just what you're saying is speak to the... Mm -hmm. Go up to the... Exactly. Yeah, you want to talk to the farmers. You want to, like... Exactly. See, so you, you're getting your bananas and your mangoes in uh, in Florida. You've got uh, cherries in the Pacific Northwest. Mm -hmm. Obviously, okay. we know the tomatoes are amazing around I, here. How do you choose the right berries? Is there a special way? Well, the berries, you, again, want them to be sort of fresh. You want them mm -hmm. to look like they're, like, mm -hmm. you know, bright and soft. Oh, but so here's the thing with like, berries... What? You want to be able to taste, right? Yeah. You want to be able to taste things, so you can actually ask them right. if you can, can just I, have a bite or two. Do you ever Don't do feel that? bad about do you ever that. Do that in the supermarket. I, Taste the grape, see if they're without sweet. Asking. I mean, you want the little yeah, samples. Like, too. don't feel bad about that. Even like green beans, something like that, you can take French a bite. Chef. You're not. There's no pressure to buy. Okay. They really want you to kind of learn and taste. Melon. I think the toughest melons. thing to pick for me is a melon. Melons How do you know it's right? So melons, you want them to smell amazing, but yeah. you but also you want them. Tell, can you? You want oh, them yeah, to feel sorry. heavy for their size. Like, touch this. Doesn't that feel heavy for its size? Yeah. Right. Because that that's, that's the right? juiciness. Those are all the juicy sugars. And then you smell them. Those are the sugars ripening in there. Also, use sight. Obviously, like bananas are an easy example. Unripe, ripe, right? The color changes and deepens, and, and uh, that's how you can tell that something is becoming. Is this you're supposed to knock on it, or is that just a one? No, that's one. just like a thing. I mean, you see people knocking; they don't know what they're doing. They're just I like. I thought they said if it's I know hollow, what I'm doing. It's, there's a know. hollow. It's really about the weight. You okay, really want to feel that heavy. weight. The heavy. Get a heavy. Okay. okay. Exactly. Um, let's move on to. Veggies. All right. So Veggies. talking again about asking questions, right? So when you go to the market, you ask the if you see something unfamiliar. So I brought some what? exciting things here. I want to see if you guys know what we have here. What is this? You know what these are? Yeah, we get. A lich I a lichy? These are yeah. rambutans. Yeah. Or rambutans. I actually looked it up. Apparently, rambutan is the British way to say it. Rambutan is the American way. I, we get these Lychees, all the time. We they're very them. similar. Lychees the pit are, inside. Yeah. Be careful. Delicious, yeah. Mm. The lychee is a little yeah. bit more floral than this. This is a little bit sweeter. A cherry. What about uh -huh. this one? Do you know what this one is? Uh, this is some kind of root. Celery root. Celery root. Yes. This okay. is amazing for pureeing. You can make soups with it. You can saute mm -hmm. it. How about this guy? Is that ginger? Is that no. garlic? Ooh. Sun Squeeze it. What? Sun what is, choke. What is that? Another root vegetable. Really delicious. Roasted, sauteed. Oh. I know you know these. Tomatilla. Mm Tomatilla. -hmm. Oh, those cool are fantastic for roasting and mm -hmm. making salsas, mm -hmm. pozole. Okay. Uh, so some of these veggies here, see how they look a little bit not like the ones you would see at the grocery store, right? So Chris Cucumber. here in from Today Show grew these in his garden. What? Yes. Yeah, so these Wait, the tomatoes, what? the eggplant, the peppers. Oh and God, so that's star, what you're gonna see fruit, at the right? yes. That's what you're going to see at the farmer's market. Things that look a little bit dragon unfamiliar, fruit. but the flavors are amazing. Is that dragon, dragon fruit? fruit? Yeah, yes. we get that. But we just, get all these different stuff. <laughs> you do? Yeah, we like yeah. all this what about stuff. You're adventurous. Do you know these? You know these? Uh, leek? Lemongrass. 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 Mm. Amazing. Whoa, 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 whoa. Yeah, whoa. I don't, flavor. I don't, I don't. Oh, these are very tart. But oh, they're yeah. fantastic in margaritas and yeah. cocktails. Okay. You need to add rum and sugar. Add okay. rum and sugar. Let's get really, we, gotta, we have to <laughs> speed through. Okay, so it's not just produce. Oh, you can also get dairy Cheese. and eggs and things like that. But the trick is to get coolers. Delicious. So delicious. Yeah. <laughs> we need the sink so you can triple. All right, so when you want to get dairy, breads, anything that's going to go bad, keep a cooler in your trunk. Or if uh -huh. you take public yeah. transportation, a right. cooler bag. That's okay. so smart. You got to rock. Very You're nice the best. Smart. To get these tips, head to Hoda or HodaandJenna.com, today.com slash food.
Well, I hope you come back tomorrow. Jill is going to join us with a new list of steals and deals. Don't want to miss that one. Have a good Tuesday, guys. When you think Texas, you think beef, brisket, and barbecue. But here in Austin, the state's capital, there's so much more than that. We've got folks and chefs from all around the world who are putting their mark on this city's culinary scene. And in fact, the spices and traditions that pay homage to their families are making Austin a hot food scene. It's really kind of this melting pot of different people, their culture, and their food. The creativity and, and the flavor that they put into the food is really artistry, right? It's really the diversity of food. Like, you can get some of everything here. So what keeps Austin weird and tasty? We're about to find out. It's time to head out of Studio 1A and hit the road for a new kind of culinary adventure. Follow me as I taste some of the most iconic foods around the country and meet the families behind them. Together, we're gonna learn how a good meal has the power to connect us to our past, our future, and each other. Austin is home to over 1,200 food trucks in food parks just like this one. But we're here for one specific truck. We're here for Tony's Jamaican, serving up fine Caribbean fare to Austin for more than 10 years. Meet food truck owner Tony Scott and his wife Kim. From humble beginnings in Kingston, Jamaica, Tony has made Austin his home since 2003, and he has always had a passion for flavorful food. When did you start cooking? How young were you? 10. Tony's mother, Hyacinth, taught her sons how to be self-sufficient, especially in the kitchen. So you learned from mom early on? Yes. What was it about cooking that you liked? I don't know, I like food, I don't know. <laughs> Those skills learned during childhood would help Tony define his career. For nearly a decade, he worked a small beachside business, serving jerk chicken and drinks to tourists in Jamaica. But after 9-11, tourism to the island stalled. So Tony moved to the U.S. in search of better opportunities, eventually landing in Austin. With construction booming in the state capital, Tony quickly found a job as a painter, but it was his homemade lunches that reignited an idea. You're working, you're, you bring in Jamaican food that you made, some of your friends taste and say, where'd this I, come from? I, yes, I cook my own food, you know, and they were like, oh, you should, you know, open a restaurant. And it's been 10 years. 10 years now. The 60-year-old chef opened Tony's Jamaican food truck in March of 2012 and his wife, Kim, has been one of his biggest supporters since the very beginning. What was the first meal he cooked for? Curry chicken and rice, and he invited me over, and once I had it, I didn't want to ask for more. You know how ladies are, we try to eat a little bit, maybe the salad kind of thing, don't want them to know that we that greedy. But it was so good, I asked for seconds. So when Tony says, I want to do a food truck, your reaction? I said, a what? <laughs> I said, a food what? And I knew nothing about food trucks or however, so it was just all his idea. I just followed along. He said he wanted to do something, he had a vision. I said, okay, let's try it. Despite high praise from friends and family for his grub, Tony's business wasn't exactly booming from the start. When you first opened up, was it successful right away? <laughs> no. <laughs> I came out here at 10 o'clock in the morning and I was all here until 3 o'clock the next morning. Oh. I made $37. Wow. 
And, you know, I was still happy when I go home and she was like, how much money you make? And I was like, $37. And she break out laughing. <laughs> and I was like, don't worry about it. And next day I come and I make $50 something dollars. And the next day I make $80 something dollars. And I say, okay, I'm seeing increase. Tony taking advantage of the South by Southwest crowds that flocked to Austin in early March. Shortly after the festival, his fledgling business got a big boost with a small write-up. Kim, what, what to you, what was the game changer? What, what put this place over the top? Wow. His presence and his dedication. Your chicken and hot sauce. Now, loyal customers are visiting this hot spot daily, decked out with the colors and vibes of Jamaica. From curried chicken and goat to jerk everything, food fans walk away feeling the island love. In 2018, Tony laid down more permanent roots in Texas. You opened up a brick and mortar restaurant. Were you nervous about that? A little bit. It was well, a little bit. Let me, Kim, were you nervous oh, about Oh yeah, that? I'm so glad you asked me that question. Yes, I was. It was something totally different and from a food truck going into a brick and mortar. I didn't come from the restaurant industry. I came from the finance side. Coming in, I was like, I was telling Tony, I said, I got this, you know, I can run this, no problem. But oh, no, 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 no. I was ringing the, the red light bell, like, hey, I need some help. It was challenging, but also it was fun. Kim now helping run the business for both locations. Family always mean a lot to restaurant. You know, sometimes she, she would say, you never know, one day it might be just me and you, you gotta That's show right. me how to cut this meat. What do you love about fatherhood? The chaos, the learning. Is climate change one of your top priorities? What's your message to girls who want to make a difference in their own communities? Believe in yourself. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Mr. Secretary, when is this going to get better? You came into this job saying you were to fight crime. Have you been successful? Found a way to put that. Can you update us on the status of negotiations? Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Right Just chicken and oxtail. Thank you Enjoy. very much, sir. Have a great day. You too. God bless. Tony Scott dishes out hundreds of plates to hungry customers each day, but he's best known for one Caribbean specialty. My mother is Jamaican. And in our house, oxtail was king. Yes. Yeah. Oxtail stew, oxtail and dumpling. Yeah. Oxtail, oh, wow. oxtail, oxtail. My mom is Southern, and she actually mentioned it to me. I said, oxtail. And she just said it was a beef. So I've never really had it. And then when you first had it? It was delicious. And I eat it all the time now. That's the problem. <laughs> Isn't it interesting that it was the cheapest cut of meat? Now it's considered wow. a delicacy. You go to all these oh. upscale restaurants, oxtail uh, ravioli, oh. oxtail rice, all them. It's now everybody's into oxtail. I know. No, I'm scared to go in a restaurant and not oxtail. <laughs> Does it? The price is so high. Bring on the oxtail stew! <laughs> Tony frequently sells out of the succulent oxtail, and it was finally time to see and taste why. Welcome to the truck, Mr. Hall. Oh, Han. yeah. Oh, it smells good. It smells like Jamaica. Oh, hey, hey. This is the oxtail, oh. the famous oxtail that everybody go crazy over. Mm -hmm. And these are like the Jamaican product seasoning that we use. This have a good flavor to mm. it. Oh, wow. 
Tony's oxtails are seasoned with a spice mix that includes garlic powder, dried onion, paprika, black pepper, sugar, salt, and a few chef secrets. This is my product that I make. It's of like onion, it, it, um, bell pepper, um, scotch bonnet pepper. I also have a little bit of garlic in there. So this is like your own concoction? Yes. And then this is another Jamaican product they call You have a Blue Mountain coffee? Uh, yeah. Well, they say it's the best coffee in the world. Well, right. this is the Blue Mountain product of burn sugar. Oh, wow. And this is what we pour on it last. Give it that, that good color. Then we just mix this up. Make sure you rub it in properly. You want everything to rub into it. Normally, if you take a smell of it, even right now. Oh, yeah. You see, you, you, you can smell that flavor in it and it doesn't even cook. It smells, it smells good. Right. He then lets the oxtails marinate overnight. Then, they're added to a pot with water and slow cooked for several hours. This what it comes out to be. Oh, now we're talking. For you to taste. Well, I came to Austin. The result, truly out of this world. You see how it fall off the bone. Mm. Oh, yeah. You know, we, we make sure we cook real tender because dental is very expensive. Mm -hmm. And you know, you go to some place, you have eating that meat and you have to be here to get it off the bone. You don't do that when you come here. Good thing Tony feels like talking. I'm too busy eating. And it doesn't stop with the oxtails. Oh, is it, Mr. Hall? That's fantastic. This is curry goat right here. Taste that. <laughs> this is the jerk pork. Oh, jerk pork. I've never had jerk pork before. Oh. And that's also oh, wow. my homemade jerk sauce that I made. Whoa. Okay, this is the famous curry chicken. And this is the carrot. Oh, so at least I can say I had my vegetables today. Yes. Look at how tender that chicken is. Tony also serves traditional peas and rice, which brought on a wave of nostalgia. This is black bean. When you open that pot, I thought, wait a minute. Yeah. This is my mother's peas and rice. This is great. And just when I thought I'd had enough? Wait a minute, I, I, I noticed. These are beef patty. I got to try that. Oh, that's a great crust. As a reminder of how far Tony's love for cooking has taken him. If you look up here, you see these little pats? Uh -huh. This pat right here is when I just started out. This is what I usually cook rice into. Wow. The reason why I keep this uh -huh. pat to show people is where Tony's Jamaican food is coming from. Mm -hmm. So what would you tell people who are thinking they've got a dream, they want to start something like you did? What would you tell them? First, you have to motivate yourself to do it. And never give up on your dream. My mama always tell me, don't make nobody tell you you can't do nothing. Tony, thank you so much. It's this a pleasure, Harley. It, it, it is nice meeting you. It feels like I'm back in Jamaica. I'm glad you have that feeling. Everything but, gonna be all right. Mr. Secretary, when is this going to get better? You came into this job saying you were to fight crime. Have you been successful? Found a way to put that. Can you update us on the status of negotiations? Welcome back to you today. We've got a lot to celebrate on this Wednesday morning. It's good to have you along with us. You don't know when your moment's coming, but when it does, you take it. Everybody's good, and that's it! Ali Jackson now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. And what do you love about fatherhood? The chaos, the learning. Is climate change one of your top priorities? What's your message to girls who want to make a difference in their own communities? Believe in yourself. The midterms are here. It's time to plan your vote. We'll provide everything you need to know to successfully cast your ballot. Just select any state you want to learn about for the primary or general election, and you'll instantly get voting rules, see the next big deadline, and learn how to take action for your plan. Voting rules have changed since 2020, and those rules vary from state to state. So it's time to get planning for 2022. Visit NBCNews.com slash plan your vote today.
Uvalde, Texas, a small town that has become yet another landmark. How long do you think it took for all this damage to occur? Can you tell us what, what it was like? With our NBC News exclusive. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Just a few miles from the hustle and bustle of downtown Austin is Mekong Bistro. It is a spot that's loved by locals and tourists alike for its Vietnamese comfort food. Who's the better cook uh, in the family? Um, I'm not going to even bother asking my mom about that because... My mom is hands down the best cook. Coi như là con tôi nó ngon lành lành ngon nấu ngon nhất. Chef Will Hyun and his siblings opened Mekon Bistro to honor their mother Ann Hang, a refugee who fled Vietnam after the fall of Saigon and working tirelessly to provide for her family in the United States. She took a chance to travel across the ocean with nothing in hand working ever since she's been over here, working from morning to night uh, and still provide us with a hot meal every day. When Macon first opened, Will hoped that his mom would finally stop working, but Anne had other plans. Technically, she's retired, but like I said, she, she would not stay home. Anne's passion for food starting in her home country. In 1972, Anne married Kia Huynh. They had four children in Vietnam. Anne turning to cooking to help support the family. This is my dad and my mom right, right before the fall of Saigon. When the Vietnam War ended, the family was looking toward a better future in their homeland. But in 1975, the Viet Cong began to invade Saigon. Anne's husband fled the city first, Will leaving when he was just seven years old. It was scary. We left separately, uh, me with my uncle and my mom with my three sisters that came a year later uh, because if you get caught, you were thrown in jail. Luckily, we made it out. We were rescued by uh, cargo boats, but uh, they rescued us. They took us to the Malaysian refugee camp. Will and his uncle secured refugee status, eventually reuniting with Will's dad in the U.S. In the years spent apart from his mother, Will began experimenting in the kitchen with a little nudge from his uncle. He told me that, you know, there's only two of us. You're going to have to do, you know, do your share. So learn to cook something. <laughs> in 1983, Anne made the journey to the U.S. with her daughters. Đi dược biên thì nó đi tàu nhỏ thì nó cũng hơi khó khăn. Nhưng mà qua được tới ấy rồi đoàn tụ gia đình đó thì rất mừng. Tại vì chồng con gặp đại mặt chồng con hết. Thành ra rất là sung sướng. But adjusting to a new country as refugees was a struggle. When we came over, you know, nothing in our pockets. We, we relied on government assistance a little bit. Luckily, she's a great cook. Uh, so it, it wasn't bad for us at all. But growing up, that's how she you know, shows us that she loved us by you know, putting all that love into the food. The family moving from Houston to Louisiana, finding work in the seafood industry. But Will wasn't so happy living in a small town. When his uncle invited him to attend high school in Austin, Will said yes right away. I fell in love with Austin. The beautiful lakes, the miles of trails, the music scene. What's there not to love? <laughs> Austin's vibrant culinary scene struck a chord. After high school, Will found work in several restaurants, dreaming of being able to showcase his mom's cooking. In 2015, the entire family moving to Austin. But Anne still wasn't sure about opening a restaurant. Asked her many, many times in the past to do something like that. She gets set against it. She said, it's way too much work. Eventually, Anne agreed to share her recipes for just one reason, her family. 
thích làm với con cái mới mới lên hai à, hát với con cho con chứ giờ lớn tuổi rồi thì cũng còn sống được bao lâu nữa <cười> thì lại giờ cho, cho con được là ngày nào thì hay ngày nấy thì hát cho con mình ngày nào thì hay ngày nấy thôi she's, she's emotional because like, you know, she basically you know, she's doing everything for her kids the first dish will added to the menu his mom's pho so pho you know at a restaurant is basically how we do pho at home uh, when we cook pho at home it's a big pot that's going to feed us for at least three days. Um, we have pho for breakfast, we have pho for lunch, we have pho for midtime snack, we have pho for dinner and pho at night for snack at night uh, until the pot's gone. With the help of his family, Will created several new dishes. Our menu does incorporate a lot of uh, fusion Asian dishes um, and that is because of the, you know, the family business. Uh, my, my mom's a cook. I cook, my sister cooks, my brother cooks. Uh, second beef dish was something that I've tried out. I consider myself a Texan. We love beef. It's a dish that my mom and I collaborated together to, to put out. Basically, this tubes of real nice tender beef that's been flashed in a wok. It's been six years since Macon Bistro opened, and Will and his mom still love working together. Làm ăn gia đình thì cái này cũng như giúp cho con thôi Thì thấy nó uh, uh, tự xúc động rồi mình ấy thôi Chứ mà đâu có biết làm sao giờ Mình thấy nó hy sinh cho con mình được thì Ngày nào thì hãy ấy vậy thôi Mình thấy nó xúc động vậy thôi I admire her great The courage it takes just to make that journey And to just stick with us no matter thick and thin She's my hero, she really is my hero Tonight, I interviewed Secretary of Transportation Pete Buttigieg about the ongoing delays. You seem to be pointing the finger at the airlines. They're pointing the finger back. Mr. Secretary, when is this going to get better? The day's biggest political stories with trusted insight now and expert analysis now. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the Press Now, streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. These are our missing daughters and sons. We need anyone who saw something to come forward. She was wearing a black jacket, a black top. I'm going to bring my son home alive. Dateline Missing in America. Listen now wherever you get your podcasts. From Brooklyn, we're next to the subway station. The state's reservoirs are alarmingly low. War will pass them by. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. The day's biggest political stories with trusted insight now and expert analysis now. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the Press Now, streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Using food to bring younger generations closer to their heritage happens in families all across America. And it's happening here at Habesha with a husband and wife team who's using their restaurant to bring their daughters closer to their Ethiopian roots. We want more than anything else people to be familiar with not just Ethiopian food, but Ethiopian culture. My name is Ine Fantu. This is my wife, Salama Bebe. We ran Ethiopian restaurant called Habesha in Austin. When it opened in 2013, Habesha was the second Ethiopian restaurant in Austin. People stay coming in here, we give them the food, they said, where's the fork? Your hands. <laughs> Ethiopian food is eaten with injera, a fermented flatbread made with teff, a gluten-free grain. You'll see a family dining and everyone is on their phone eating and really not enjoying the, the, the event. Mm, you cannot here. do that in Ethiopian restaurants. You have to use your hands, you can't. Both of them. That emphasis on family is everywhere in Habesha, from the Ethiopian art and decor 
to Yidni and Salam's daughters, who can often be found studying at the restaurant. I think I was like around four years old when we opened, so like this is like my second home. Salam and Yidni were born and raised in different parts of Ethiopia. In the 90s, they left Africa to attend college here in the United States. Yidni immigrating to Texas, Salam to Maryland, where her family owned an Ethiopian restaurant. A chance meeting bringing them together. My dad was visiting a friend dining at uh, her family restaurant, and she happened to be the waitress. And uh, he overheard a music playing and uh, asked her, hey, uh, where could I get the CD? And she was nice enough to, to grab the CD and hand it to him. But Yidney's dad was thinking about more than music. When he got home, he immediately gave his son a call. And he said, hey, just uh, call her and thank her for me. <laughs> <laughs> when he called me, I was like, I give it to your dad, not for you. <laughs> and then he kept calling me. I was like, OK, I think he's not going to give up. My dad was uh, one who hooked me up. <laughs> <laughs> they dated long distance before Salam moved to Texas, the couple marrying in 2003. Their daughters, Edel and Azel, are now teenagers. I feel like we've always been around food. My mom's always cooking. For me, I love her pancakes. She makes <laughs> the best pancakes. Salam left the restaurant industry to focus on parenting, but Yidni knew his wife's heart was in cooking professionally. What I saw in her was the passion to own her own business. I really want to open restaurant, and I love the customer service and cooking. In 2012, Yidni and Salam finding the perfect location for their restaurant. Austin is a, a, a very unique town in that there is people from all walks of life. And I think part of the reason that we are successful is because of that diversity. Habesh's menu honors their Ethiopian heritage with many vegetarian dishes, from stewed yellow split peas to braised collard greens. They also serve more than a dozen dishes with beef. Texas is, uh, has a lot of people that loves meat, so we have a bigger selection of meat as well. And I think my favorite dish in that is the kutfo, or the steak tartare, when it's uh, done right. That's probably the best dish in the world. It's a ground beef and mixed with butter and spices. When the pandemic hit, Habish's popularity helped save them from closure. And I said, okay, this is it. I uh, think we're going to fall down now. And then people, they support us. They love to be here. They send us check. They send us cards. We have a good, good community. The donations from fans kept them afloat until they figured out a to-go plan. Before COVID, takeout business was only 3 or 4% of our business. And overnight, we had to do 100% of our business. And by nature, Ethiopian food does not take out, so we have to figure out a way to package the food, to market the food. After laying off most employees, the couple had to work nonstop. As the to-go business began ramping up, Edel and Azel pitched in to support their parents and save their beloved second home. I would write down like the orders, like the online orders, and I would like put them in the kitchen and cleaning, washing the dishes, cutting the injera, like folding it, boxing up to the orders. They did a lot and they're part of the reason why we're still around. So I'm sorry I get a little emotional when I talk about them, but uh, yeah, they're, uh, they're incredible. They're uh, just a uh, love of my life. One of the things that we instill in them is knowing who they are, uh, where their parents came from, and learning the culture, learning the food. Salam is looking forward to a busier future at her dream restaurant. I want to uh, grow this business, and a lot of people, they never had Ethiopian food. They had Chinese food, Italian food, or Indian food. So they don't know about Ethiopian food. I'm really proud of her because like she she gets frustrated at times, but she doesn't let that like stop her. A really big inspiration to me. Whenever things get hard, you just keep going. 
best part working with your partner is the fact that you're there for each other, to comfort each other when it's down and uh, to be there when your partner needs you. The best part of it, he knows what I can't do, he covered. The same thing, he cannot cook. <laughs> So, okay, she can handle it. With Austin's welcoming atmosphere, it's no surprise that more chefs are putting down roots in this fast-growing city. It's everything from James Beard, award-winning chefs, and taqueros, and even home cooks. The thing that makes a food scene good is different cultures meeting each other and being able to influence each other. The fact that anything is possible is what makes Austin such a cool place. One thing that rings true here in Austin, no matter your background or culture, there's room for everyone at the table. Welcome to Wellness Today. I'm Chanel Jones. We've made it to July and summer is here in full swing. This year I've been trying to live what I call self-care summer. Making time for daily quick walks, maybe my annual checkups, all so I can be the best version of myself. Summer is also the perfect time to tap into play and have a little fun. It's also the season to eat more fruits and vegetables. And why not take a staycation while trying outdoor activities like kayaking? So join me as we make our own well-being a priority and celebrate self-care summer. While many of us think of self-care as a time spent resting and relaxing, it's also important to experience all the fun that life can offer. But how can play impact our health for the better? Take a look. From kicking a soccer ball to playing a game on your phone, fun is a feeling that many crave. Play really is a basic human need. For Dr. Edward Laskowski, play has been at the center of much of his work. We all need a release from the stress that we're under. We need our minds to, to be free, to be innovative, and to be creative. Play traces its roots to humans' closest friends. It's interesting, in the animal kingdom, we see play commonly exhibited in the ape family, how the young ones are, in essence, almost taught through play different maneuvers. I think in, in humans, oftentimes we think of play as reserved only for kids, but those unique advantages of play also extend to adults. Play can come in a number of forms. There are three types of play. There's social play, where we play with each other, and this could be playing games, but it may be also exercising with friends and, and doing stuff together. There's also benefits of independent play, which means we may do something by ourselves. We may love to do a, a Sudoku or a puzzle or a Wordle today. And guided play is, is something that maybe we'll be instructed in a, in a new a new activity. Maybe we'll get cooking together and we'll, um, make pasta or something like that. The impact of play, tangible and meaningful at any age. It actually changes, it produces muscle relaxation. It can increase blood flow when it's combined with movement. Those are all good physical things that it does. And psychologically, it does a, a huge benefit as far as reducing stress, reducing anxiety, modifying the effects of depression and those who have frequent play incorporated into their lifestyle. Proving that taking time for fun can be of immense value. When we step back, when we're given a chance to let our minds run free and play and, and figure out things in a different way than a job way, that all helps our, our whole state of being. Now that we've seen the science behind why play is important, let's break down how we can have a little fun. We're excited to welcome someone who knows how to have a good time. Annie F. Downs is an author, speaker, and podcast host who is the founder of the That Sounds Fun Network, where she celebrates the idea of fun and helps people find it themselves every single day. Welcome to you, Annie. Oh, hi, Chanel. Happy self-care summer. Happy self-care summer. It's funny because I made it up literally in the doctor's office and it's become a thing. Um, all right, so this sounds even silly to ask, <laughs> but what does it mean, uh, you know, when we talk about having fun and play? It isn't silly to ask because kids get it, but adults have forgotten, right? Like we just don't mm. prioritize play and fun anymore, but we feel it in our bodies. I mean, it is part of self-care. What's true about you and I both, Chanel, is we put everything in our lives and make time for what makes us healthy. And fun is part of that. 
I believe it. So if you're not feeling your best, I mean, everybody knows how to have fun if you're in a good mood and you're going to a party. Talk about some things that we can do, um, you know, to, to find it. Yeah, I mean, it's the it's the challenge of holding both the joy and suffering of life and telling yourself the truth. If things are hard, that is okay. But can you also find a little fun in your day? You can do it alone. There's a lot of ways that you can have fun with what matters most to you, with your partner, with your friends, with kids in your life, with your community. I mean, there is fun really everywhere. As long as you don't think fun has to be big and expensive. If you can remember fun can be small and quiet, Sometimes, not all the time, I'm not very often quiet, mm. but it can be short and it can be inexpensive. It's it is really available to you to help you feel healthy. I know, you know, I was just reading that, you know, it's important to be able to have fun by yourself. Can you give me some ideas about that? It can end up feeling a little selfish to some people, but the reality is it makes you who you want to be. And if we work so hard, I love this quote. Someone says, if we work so hard with our minds, we need to rest and have fun with our hands. And if we work every day mm. with our hands, we need to be resting with our minds. So because I write books and I'm like you, I talk all day long. One of my favorite hobbies, I brought it to show you, Cheryl. I cross stitch. I did the entire mm. skyline. I'm very proud of myself. <laughs> but I it love just keeps that. My thing to do. And thank you. I'm very proud. <laughs> it gives your hands something to do. So it can be gardening or cooking or playing a sport or working outside, just, just running around, doing things like cross stitch or knitting, things that are small and in your home you can do by yourself. It'll just bring you joy and get you off your phone. Scrolling is not a hobby, Chanel. We know that, right? Scrolling's Ooh, not a hobby. That's a t-shirt. Scrolling is not a hobby. Right? Let's talk about having fun with a partner when we get that special one-on-one -on -one time together. What do you recommend? Yeah, I have often found for myself and for my friends that when you are with your partner, if you will just ask them, what sounds fun to you? I know that sounds really simple, Chanel, but if you say what sounds fun to you and then you ask them why three times, hmm. by the time you get that third why, they're actually telling you something about self-care and about their heart and about their childhood. And so you can kind of say, man, I didn't know that was important to you when you were little, or I didn't know that mattered so much to you. You said you wanted to play basketball, but what I'm hearing you say is that was a hobby you and your dad did together and you really missed your dad. In every city we live in, there's things we haven't explored, right? So keep it local, keep it interesting. Look online and look and see what restaurants everybody else is eating at that you haven't tried yet. And kind of being an adventurer in your own life is so fun. It's like marriage therapy through fun. Uh, let's talk about friendships. I, even for me, especially, you know, a lot of us have younger ones. And so we're so busy by the time we do work and try to connect with our spouses and try to connect with our children. Our friends sometimes fall by the wayside. So what's your advice for how to stay in touch and build in fun uh, with your friends? This is going to sound way too easy, but the reality is you just put it on your calendar. And then the fun thing is what ends up happening when you put it on your calendar and you get in a group text, all of a sudden you're going, what are we going to do? Well, what sounds fun to you? Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, this actual deep conversation happens among friends. And you go, I, I didn't know that mattered to you. Yes, we will do that. And by the time that thing on the calendar gets here, you know your people better and you're getting to have fun together. And I think you're right. I've even noticed with my friendships, just through planning something far off, it's just the day to day thread sometimes where you can stay connected, you know? Yes. And it just makes you feel. Um, more like you. It does for me at least. Like, And that's what we're doing. If we're looking at fun as part of self-care, we're going, how can I be more like me and a healthier version of me after this summer? And one of the ways is more connection and fun breeds connection. I love it. All right. So finally, let's talk about ideas for your kids and how they can have fun. Sometimes it can feel like another job, but you've got three things here. You've got a soccer ball, a Frisbee, and I'm not sure what this is. It's a towel? It's a blanket. A blanket? Yeah. Oh, it's a picnic. It looks like a picnic blanket. Yes, that's exactly right. I'm telling you, those are the three things I keep in my car all the time. I brought it here with me. I keep those in my trunk all the time because anytime I'm with kids, I'm not married yet, don't have kids yet, but they are all over my life. And if I'm with kids mm -hmm. and suddenly they can throw a Frisbee, I want to be ready. And so when it comes to kids, you know if you, what? That's if you so good. Them, so fun. If you will let them lead. If you will, if you ask them what sounds fun to you and they say, I would love to go jump in a creek and you go, 
all right, we'll figure it out. It may be messy, but if you will let them lead, kids are going to take you to fun almost every time. I love it. Sometimes adults, we just need to let go a little bit. Good advice. Right. Thank you, Annie. Annie's book, Chase the Fun, 100 Days to Discover Fun Right Where You Are, uh, released August the 2nd. Thank you, Annie. It was nice to talk to you today. Uh, you too. Go out All and have right. some fun while you mm -hmm. have self-care. Cheers to that. All right, coming up, a nutritionist shares tips to eat more fruits and vegetables. And later, a quick upper body workout that will help you find your confidence this season. All that and more just ahead on Wellness Today. You open the door for so many people. I love working with people. I did not do any of this by myself. Hello. Lizzo, you put a smile on yes. every single face. It feel like Christmas and my birthday or something. <laughs> The day's biggest political stories with trusted insight now and expert analysis now. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the Press Now, streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. We will meet Ukrainians who are defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. Who is this? The day's biggest political stories with trusted insight now and expert analysis now. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the Press Now, streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. You open the door for so many people. I love working with people. I did not do any of this by myself. Hello. Lizzo, you put a smile on yes. every single face. It feel like Christmas and my birthday or something. <laughs> Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Welcome back. The most recent American Dietary Guidelines suggest that healthy eating includes consuming a variety of fruits and vegetables, as we all know. So with summer in full swing, a lot of popular produce is in peak season across the country. So if you're hoping to take advantage of this and increase your fruit and vegetable intake, we have registered dietitian Vanessa Rosetto. She is here with some tips and some yummy recipes to make it easier, something you can try today when you get home or if you are at home. Hello. Hi, nice to see you. So I think most people know we should be eating fruits and vegetables yada, yada, yada. But yep. can you give us really quickly just a real, I guess, a better understanding of the benefits, what we underestimate? Yeah, you know, fruits and vegetables have antioxidants, they have vitamins, they have minerals, they help with your gut health. You know, there's a lot of fiber in fruits and vegetables, so that helps to keep you full. So if you're looking for a lot of bang for your buck when you're eating a meal, you always want to pair it with a fruit or a vegetable. Right. I think people think it's all or nothing. Like, I have to eat only plants in order for me to be healthy. And that's not entirely true. It's just like, let's look for ways to incorporate it at most meals. So it's really easy to get them in at breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and you don't have to roast, you know, broccoli and, you know, turn your oven on. You right. can just, like, simply slice up carrots like I do with my kids. And so they're not going to eat roasted, you know, slaw or anything like that, but they'll grab the carrots and put it on the side of their protein, and that, that's the vegetable that they're eating for the day. All right. So with that said, let's dig in. The beautiful part to me about this season, you get to try fruits and vegetables or things that are in season that maybe you normally wouldn't try. Yep. Um, so what should we start with? This looks yummy. Yes. It's grilled romaine. Really? Grilled romaine. Okay. Yeah, um, I you know I work with uh, some really great people who've taught me this trick, which is take the romaine, put it on the grill, the whole thing, the whole thing, okay. a little bit of olive oil, salt, pepper, lemon juice, and it's just a fun way right. to eat lettuce. Like the lettuce doesn't have to be dry. You don't have to put rice wine vinegar on it and that's it. You're not relegated to misery just because you're eating a green. There's nothing else in there that's really good. No, there's nothing else in there. Parmesan cheese, shaved parmesan oh. will take things to another so place. So wait, take the wait, what's on there again? That's so the when you're grilling the romaine, it's just mm. olive oil. Finish it off with some lemon juice. Mm. Then when you're making your meal, right? Here's some rice. I got some chickpeas for some for some extra protein okay. and then some shaved Parmesan on top. Mm. It just like gives it a different flavor profile and it makes you want to eat it. Mm. It's not dull and, and dry. You know, it's a healthier choice, but it's legitimately yummy. Yeah. So you don't feel like you're depriving yourself. Exactly. That's good. All right. So next, 
What's this next one? You want to do this one? The frittata. Yeah, okay. so the frittata is the go-to on a Friday because the kids are always like at the pool, at camp, they're eating pizza and all these things, so it's not like they're not enjoying their summer. Sure. Sure. Um, but, you know, you, you go out and you buy these vegetables because they're in season, mm -hmm. and you're like, oh, I'm going to try something new, and then the week goes by and you didn't use it. It's true. So it's really easy to just crack 12 eggs, put that in a bowl, whisk it up, mm -hmm. get whatever the spinach or the broccoli that might be turning and isn't going to be good the next day, and just bake it in the oven really quick, and then I'll chop up any kind of, you know, mm. onion and um, broccoli and maybe some zoodles and bell peppers and a little bit of balsamic vinegar, and we have dinner that night, and we probably have breakfast the next morning. You can morning. save it. Yeah. It goes well in the fridge. Yeah. Wasted so many vegetables. Yeah. They just forget that they're there. Yeah, you yeah. and everybody else, and like, or they just don't know what to do with them, That's right? True. So a lot of times I tell people, don't be afraid to buy frozen vegetables or frozen fruit. It really minimizes waste. They're allowed to ripen to the peak, and then it's minimal processing, flash frozen. So then you just take what you need when you need it. You can, you know, store it for the next time, yeah. and it doesn't go bad right away. This is good. All right, so this one, we should put the recipe on the website. What is this? So this is just a bunch of vegetables that, you know, are always turning in my refrigerator. Absolutely. Because, you know, it's like, oh, I'm going to buy these six yep. red bell peppers, and then I'm going to make my husband go down mm. and grill them, and then that never happened. Mm, what's <laughs> right? in there? Yeah, so it is um, red onions, because red onions takes everything to another place that I love so much. Different types of peppers, right? Some zucchini, you know, you shave them really thin, some okay. balsamic vinegar, a little olive oil, done. It doesn't, is there, like, goat cheese or something? In the it? goat cheese is on the... Um, oh, that's why. I was like, mm, <laughs> what is this? Because it all, all works together. together. It all works together, but that's the thing. You don't have to make it complicated. You have these things already in your house. So just chop and serve. Vanessa, that's really good. Good. Okay, last but not least, a lot of us like to throw kebabs on the grill. Yeah, so, so, what, so what I will do is, because I love pineapple, I'm still thinking about the pineapple that I had in Maui in 2006 on my honeymoon. <laughs> um, and so I will get a pineapple, mm -hmm. chop it up, I'll make the, the kebabs, Grilling pineapple brings out like a different kind of sweetness and also the same when you're doing red onion or eggplant or tomatoes It brings this sweetness to it. That's really fun And so you'll have that and maybe you're gonna have it as an appetizer and I'll put out nuts my favorite pistachios with, That are salt and vinegar pistachios <laughs> try them. They're delicious. It gives a different flavor profile Sometimes I will you know grill up some chicken and then maybe tomorrow I'm gonna use these kebabs with my chicken and make a different kind of chicken salad mm -hmm. And then I don't need to have you know extra lettuce so there's just always some quick ways for you to have really fun and different foods that are plant forward yeah. that don't take a ton of time for you to make. Honestly, this is a good segment just because we know we're supposed to eat fruits yes. and vegetables, but we get in a rut yeah. when it comes to figuring out what to do with yeah. them. And like you said, we don't want to be in the kitchen all day. Yeah. So look at this table, everybody. These are all things that we can do. Thank you so much, Vanessa. Thanks for having me. These are really yummy. By the way, there are so many easy recipes that make fruits and vegetables the star of any meal. So I'm glad we did this. Just go to today.com slash food for breakfast, lunch, dinner. We have inspiration there. Thank you, Vanessa. Thank you so much. All right, coming up, hitting the pool or beach, use dumbbells and resistance bands to strengthen your arms for a better swim. And later, take a trip down the Hudson River in a kayak. That's right after this. Good evening from New Orleans. Nice to go really spend some time with you. Appreciate it. We'll meet Ukrainians who are defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. Hey, who's this? These are our missing daughters and sons. We need anyone who saw something to come forward. She was wearing a black jacket, a black top. I'm going to bring my son home alive. Dateline Missing in America. Listen now wherever you get your podcasts. The midterms are here. It's time to plan your vote. We'll provide everything you need to know to successfully cast your ballot. Just select any state you want to learn about for the primary or general election, and you'll instantly get voting rules, see the next big deadline, and learn how to take action for your plan. 
Voting rules have changed since 2020, and those rules vary from state to state. So it's time to get planning for 2022. Visit NBCNews.com slash plan your vote today. These are our missing daughters and sons. We need anyone who saw something to come forward. She was wearing a black jacket, a black top. I'm going to bring my son home alive. Dateline Missing in America. Listen now wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back. As temperatures heat up, we're showing off our arms and tank tops and sleeveless dresses. Fitness expert Stephanie Mansour is going to demonstrate easy exercises that will tone our upper body and inspire some confidence throughout the rest of the summer. Hey everyone, I'm your trainer Stephanie Mansour and right now we're all enjoying the best parts of summer, plus all of the outdoor activities like swimming, biking and kayaking. So today I'm going to take you through a few easy exercises that you can do to strengthen and tone the upper body and the arms so that you feel good and strong in your summer tank tops and your sleeveless dresses. You can use dumbbells or resistance bands for these moves. I'm going to show you how to use them both. Let's start with bicep curls. Now we're going to pick up the dumbbells here and I have three pound weights, but you can start as low as one pound or you can go up as high as seven or eight pounds. So starting with your feet as wide as your shoulders, pull your abs in, softly bend your knees. We're going to externally rotate the arms and move into a bicep curl with external rotation. We keep the elbows hugged in towards the side of your body so that we maintain proper form without getting out of alignment. We do 10 of those with the dumbbells. As an alternative, we can do 10 with the resistance bands. So standing on the resistance band with your feet as wide as your shoulders, externally rotating the shoulders here and the arms, holding those handles, exhale, curl up towards the shoulders and lower. Now what's great about these resistance bands is you'll feel resistance on the way up and on the way down of every single movement. Now next I'm going to show you an overhead press and this is a great move to work those shoulders and help make them look nice and sleek. We're going to start with the weights as high as your ears here in a goal post position. Pull your abs in, exhale, press the weights up over the head and come back to center. So you want to make sure that you can look forward and see these weights in your peripheral vision. Now you might be asking, okay, that's great, but how can I do that exercise with resistance bands? Let me show you how. What we're going to do is instead of stepping on the resistance band with both feet, we're going to step with one foot forward, one foot back in a staggered position. Pull the abs in, bend the front knee slightly, hold on to the resistance band handles at your ears. This is ear level in that goal post position. Exhale to press up and inhale lower. For the tricep kickback, we're gonna lean forward, abs in tight, and hug the elbows up towards the sides. As you have the elbows bent, you're gonna exhale and extend the arms back and then come to center. Make sure the upper arms are not moving. The upper arms are nice and stationary here as you're reaching the dumbbells back as if you're trying to punch the wall behind you with the tip of the dumbbell. Now I'm gonna show you from the other side too, leaning forward, hugging those elbows in, this is our starting position. We exhale, press back, inhale to center. Now we're gonna do the same motion with the resistance band, but instead of making you go get a new set of resistance bands, use the one with your handles, but have the handles hanging here with your hand underneath the resistance band, holding onto it at your chest. Use the other hand here with tension on the band, and then exhale to straighten the arm down, inhale to bend it. Exhale, straighten it down, Inhale to bend. The next exercise, a lateral raise. So again, we're going back to those shoulders. So pick up those dumbbells for the dumbbell version of the lateral raise. Stand with the feet as wide as the hips, abs in, knees softly bent. We're gonna exhale to bring the weights up as high as the shoulders, great. And then inhale, lower down. We can also do this with the resistance band. So what we're gonna do is grab the resistance band, step on it with both feet, and then we're gonna open the arms out to the sides as high as the shoulders and lower down. And notice we've got that tension again on the upward motion and on the downward motion. All right, the last exercise in this upper body workout is V for victory. So we all wanna feel victorious this summer and every day. So we're gonna start with the feet as wide as the hips, 
Hold those dumbbells down at your hips. From here, we're gonna lift the weights up into a V as high as the shoulders and lower down. Good, so I've got my palms facing each other on this because it's more comfortable to hold onto the dumbbells this way. And I don't want you to have to use your forearms or any other muscles to do this, aside from the upper arms and the shoulders. Now, we're gonna lift up the resistance band to do this and watch as I hold onto this resistance band with a different grip. So, standing on the resistance band with your feet as wide as your hips, hold the bands down at your hips, and then with the palms face down, we're gonna lift up to that V and lower down. Good. Lift up to the V, relax the traps, lower down. So we do 10 reps of each of these. We repeat the entire series for three times total. And I promise you, if you do this routine every other day for a couple of weeks, you are gonna notice a major transformation in your arms and you're gonna feel so strong. Thank you, Stephanie. You can do each of these exercises for 10 reps and do three rounds for a complete upper body workout. And it's never too late to get moving. In fact, join the Start Today community on Facebook to find others just like you who are getting stronger each day. Coming up, Donna shows off an easy staycation exercise that's perfect for the whole family just ahead. Stay with us. Hallie Jackson now. Weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson. Streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. We'll meet Ukrainians who are defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. Man, who's this? These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. The midterms are here. It's time to plan your vote. We'll provide everything you need to know to successfully cast your ballot. Just select any state you want to learn about for the primary or general election, and you'll instantly get voting rules, see the next big deadline, and learn how to take action for your plan. Voting rules have changed since 2020, and those rules vary from state to state. So it's time to get planning for 2022. Visit NBCNews.com slash plan your vote today. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Welcome back to Wellness Today. The best part of summer is the adventures, and oftentimes there is one right in your own backyard. We are joining today contributor Donna Farazan as she goes on a relaxing kayaking journey down the Hudson River. I kind of immediately feel like I'm on vacation. Yeah, exactly. You feel like you're in the Caribbean and you're only 20 minutes outside of New York City. There's more to do in Sleepy Hollow than hunt for the headless horseman. Wow, this is gorgeous. Look at this. Can I dip my toe in? Absolutely, absolutely. Feel this the water is the first beach of the season, Mike. Whew. A little chilly, but refreshing. Why should kayaking be on everyone's list this summer? It's the memories. You know, the memories that you go to experience with family, friends. It's a team building activity. My guide, Mike Napoleon, has led kayak tours with Hudson River Recreation for the past four seasons. I always kind of introduce people to paddling sports as a lazy man sport. You want to do minimal effort to get as far as you want to go and then get to your destination and enjoy it. The water conditions are, are everything. You always kind of want to know your scenarios and know what you're getting into before you go. After I got my life jacket on securely, Mike showed me a few paddling basics before we hit the water. So if I take the center of my paddle here, I throw it right over my head and I use that as my middle point and I make two boxes here, one right here and then another one with this arm. I now know that my elbows are right at 90 degrees. So now I can take my paddle and I know the optimum placement for my hands. Okay. The big thing is it's a sweep stroke. And the reason I say that is because it's really easy to remember that you're almost trying to sweep the floor. And that's going to actually help me nice out and wide and actually help me to actually turn the boat. I feel ready for a total body workout. I hopped in the cockpit. All right, you all set? I already love it. I could just sit here. We have to paddle now? <laughs> well, that's part of the fun, but we don't have to go too far. It's all about enjoying the paddle. I feel like I'm the star of my own movie right now. 
There you go. Look at your cruising now. I'm going to have to catch up. Come catch up, Mike. <laughs> Full speed ahead. And anyone can give this sport a try. Kayaking for everyone. I mean, all ability levels, all age groups. There's adaptive kayaking where there's special equipment that's involved. So it really has made the sport very inclusive and very adaptive, too. Now, as we come around the bend here, we have a fantastic view of the Tappan Zee Lighthouse, a great view of the Tappan Zee Bridge. There's something about being on the water, being able to just reach out and touch it. It's cleansing. Oh, it feels really good. I will say the other great thing about this sport is that I really am only thinking about what I'm doing right exactly. now. Exactly, you're in the, the moment. Present. The water is crystal. The water is beautiful, the perfect clear. temperature too. Couldn't ask for a better day. What's your favorite thing to do at the end of each kayaking session? I mean, obviously, are, are some nice tacos and a cerveza. Tacos Absolutely. and a beer? Absolutely. That's the way to go. I had a great time, and I think we have one more thing that we need to do. Do you? Yeah. I have a little something for you. Thank you for being such a gracious host. Now oh. it's time for my favorite part. Perfect. <laughs> Thank you very much. Cheers. 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 Great Cheers. paddling with you. Great paddling with you to kayaking, to a the new views. den that I need, and uh, to the views. Absolutely. Cheers. Thanks to Hudson River Recreation for guiding Donna's trip in Sleepy Hollow. Well, thank you for joining me to embrace the joy that I call self-care summer. I hope you feel inspired to have some fun, eat a little healthier, and move in ways that makes your body feel energized, and to use this summer to prioritize you. I'm Chanel Jones, and we'll see you next time on Wellness Today. So, I, listen, without giving away too much, mm -hmm. and I know you won't, what, what, is, what is NOPE about? It's about a lot of things. Um, and, and I think, you know, the, the first notion that uh, I latched onto when I was writing this movie was this idea of, of making a spectacle, making something people would have to see. Right here, you are going to witness an absolute spectacle. So what happens next? Are you ready? Mm-hmm. Are you ready? Here we go. And and I, I felt like I was uh, I was fighting for cinema. I was fighting for the theater theatrical experience when I was writing this film. So it's about spectacle. And from there, I, I, I explored that and started to sort of uncover what I think is like the dark side of our relationship with spectacle. You could make the argument, I watched it last night, you could make the argument that the film, at least on its face, seems to be about this idea that spectacle can consume us, does consume us, quite literally, in, in some cases. Is, is that part of, of what we were going for? I mean, we are, <laughs> I like what you did. The, it, look, this is a society of the spectacle. And I think that uh, the, the, the idea of spectacle um, harms us in many ways, whether it's something we are so obsessed by that we, um, we give it too much power because it's, uh, it has a spect spectacular nature to it, or if it's because we use the spectacle to distract the, ourselves from the truth. We have this very, uh, very uh, dark relationship with it. And I, I, I think about bottlenecking, right? When we're, when we're driving, when we're in traffic and there's an accident, and that traffic slows down. Yeah. It's because everybody's sneaking a peek at that awful spectacle and it's slowing everybody down. And so that, I latched onto that and said, let's make a movie about that. This would be an opportunity. I'm talking rich and famous for life. There's plenty of videos for flying online. You know what nobody gonna get what we gonna get. What we gonna get? The money shot. It's about human nature. Yeah. All my films are about human nature and about something that um, I fear is part of our DNA and, and scares me. And it's something that I share with us, but I, 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 I feel like it, it hasn't been sort of pinpointed yet. I, I read uh, in an interview recently that, that you 
you maintain this is not a film that could have been made five years ago. Why not? Uh, I think there's, you know, a, a lot of reasons. You know, I think from a, a, a from from the standpoint of uh, you know representation, I think this idea of you know letting a black director um, put his vision into a, a film and commit to it and, and into a you know a fly, the great American flying saucer film. Um, you know, I, I let's just let's put it this way: five years ago, I didn't think they would ever let me do that. And so I, uh, and then even you know on the on the technological front, yeah. you know, I worked with cinematographer Hoyt van Hoytema, um, who is absolute legend, and and some of the techniques we developed on this to achieve spectacle have never been attempted before, and um, and so I, I'm just very proud of what we pulled off in you that know, way. A couple times I'm watching, I'm I'm thinking. This is expensive. This, this is this is really expensive. They gave Jordan Peele the checkbook, and I'm like, go do what you want. Hey, you know, <laughs> yeah. I mean, look, they, I, I, that that's an, another piece of this puzzle yeah. is that you know, so much of my uh, career before I became a director was, you know, marred with this. Um, this uh, internalized sense that I could never be allowed to do that, that no one would ever trust me with, the, with money, uh, in, you know, enough money to do my, to do my vision, yeah. the way they would trust other people. I, just, I felt that that was true. And so here I am, Universal Studios, they, they've proven me wrong. Get Out, the, the social commentary on, on, on race is, is obvious um, with this is wait. We have to wait for the um, the tram to go by. Yes, yeah. these which are is, folks by the, who are going to be coming to see. This is monumental. This is what I'm about. This is what it's about right here. We that, right now, them over. they think that I it's am. Jordan Peele. Yeah. Mr. Peele. It's, it's his set. Welcome. Yeah. Welcome. They'll come back next week. They come, yeah. They'll think I'm I'm an animatronic. <laughs> that's just here, and they'll come back. So get out. Obviously, I mean the social commentary there on 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 race is it's pretty obvious. Do you find the being African American as more advantage or disadvantage in the modern world? <laughs> it's a tough one. <laughs> yeah, I don't know, man. And I think you can make the argument that that us is sort of about uh, what human beings, like what we're capable of, the mm -hmm. sinister nature of, of our behavior. This doesn't seem to be as much about race. Is that is that by design? Yeah, you know, it's certainly not as much about Get Out, where you know the very fabric of the plot um, um, the machinations were about you know this racial dynamic. You know, I I feel like it's impossible to make a mo movie with um, people of color in it and have it not be about race. I mean, hell, I think it's impossible to make a. a any movie without it being about race, because you know race is all around us. You know, I think what what is interesting and and sort of where the the notion of nope and the title came from, which on one hand is you know something that Black people recognize as our point of view in horror situations, is this acknowledgement that of this thing we're talking about, where this is this you can't have Black people in a flying saucer film and just have it be the same experience. It's just, it's not, there's a, there's a different r relationship. No, 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 no. And this film is, is also, which is, takes place uh, in the outskirts of uh, Hollywood or the, um, you know, the, the industry of the spectacle, um, you know, is also so wrapped up with this idea of um, uh, representation and erasure, which, you know, those, theme, those themes are in there, but to your point, um, it, it, it's, an, it, it's an adventure and a horror spectacle about, about human nature. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. The day's biggest political stories with trusted insight now and expert analysis now. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the Press Now, streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. It's a can't-miss summer on today. Ah! 
they are walking strong. Elegant and pretty easy to prepare. How to cut costs on your vacation. Vicky has the answers. Every single thing you need for the best summer yet. Only on Today. Today is now a podcast. Available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Tonight, I interviewed Secretary of Transportation Pete Buttigieg about the ongoing delays. You seem to be pointing the finger at the airlines. They're pointing the finger back. Mr. Secretary, when is this going to get better? It's a can't-miss summer on today. Ah! They are walking strong, elegant, and pretty easy to prepare. How to cut costs on your vacation? Vicki has the answers. Every single thing you need for the best summer yet. Only on today. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. They're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No. Top Story with Tom Hamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. I think, you know, as we talk about spectacles, you know, it becomes abundantly clear that all the... The themes and characters in this movie interact or represent the media in some way and uh, or some faction of mm -hmm. it. And uh, obviously the nucleus of the media I'm sort of examining here is is, is Hollywood mm -hmm. it, and uh, the selling of, of dreams, the selling of nightmares, the selling of illusion. Um, is, uh, is, is that, that's in the cornerstone of the piece. But it's not just an indictment of Hollywood. I mean, there, there, are, there are a couple moments in the film where it's sort of an indictment of of, of us, yeah. of, of of journalism. Yeah, yeah. Any 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 time that we're going to make money yeah. off of the human need to see something crazy, mm -hmm. um, that to me is what what I call spectacleization. God. And I'm a I'm I'm a guilty party. Yeah, you're a guilty party. Um, we pretty, we, we kind of all are yeah. in some ways, whether what, whatever side we're all, all on it, and that's kind of the point. We are, by the way. Okay, here we go. This is a big deal. This is a because Jordan Peele yeah. has been memorialized. Memorialized? Is on that, the, oh, I mean, on does the that line, happen after you've got Jaws, you've I'm got just, Back to the Future? Yeah, but I'm you don't still, have a lot of sets. I just. But I mean, well, that's true. That's, that's, that's a good point. But you know what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, I mean, this is a big yeah, deal. No, this is good. This is this is this, this is your set. Uh huh. So this, uh, if I can tell you about the the, I would the, love the space. Yeah. I know you saw the film, but uh, this is Jupiter's Claim, um, which is a a theme park uh, owned by a former child star, a Ricky Juke Park, played by Stephen Yun. Mm -hmm. um, it, it is in the vision of the movie a Kid Sheriff that he was in as a child in the mid '90s. I don't know if you remember that film, Kid Share. I, I do not. Know. Okay, well, well that's real. Yeah. Um, and here we are. And and obviously, um, you know, it, there, there's there's more to meets the eye than here. So you know, if you're going to see, when you're going to see Nope. Yeah. So there there is another layer um, <laughs> to to what happens here. You don't want to give away too much. Don't want to give away too much. But, uh, but you could make the argument that this is a centerpiece of of the film, the Star Lasso. Experience. We won't tell folks exactly. We won't tell people what happened. What there, happened here? But um, something did happen there. Something did occur. And uh, yeah, here we are. No, I mean, look, you know, it's a, a UFO movie, yeah. and um, yeah, there's there is a you know something about this world that to, to juxtapose the sort of uncanny valley um, world of this of this um, th th this um, this sort of mom and park theme park. Yeah. Um, right in the middle of a uh, sort of UFO hotspot, um, it was just the kind of juxtaposition that was, it was very me, I thought. If someone had said to you 10, 15, 20 years ago that Jordan Peele, one of his films would, would, would mm. have permanent space here on the lot at Universal, what would you have said? I would have said, well, then it would have worked. My plan would have worked. <laughs> This um, is part of the grand plan all along. I mean, yeah. Okay. You know, I don't. You know, I don't know if I knew to really dream this big, but I. But I did. I did. I mean, when I. You know, when I first came to Universal Studios as a kid, I. I was very enamored with um, the. I was just very enamored with movie making, and and the idea of being in the space where people actually make movies, mm. and I, I just want to. And and so. 
you know, to have a home on, on a, a lot, let alone this lot, is just very special to me. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. They're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. These are our missing daughters and sons. We need anyone who saw something to come forward. She was wearing a black jacket, a black top. I'm going to bring my son home alive. Dateline Missing in America. Listen now wherever you get your podcasts. We'll meet Ukrainians who are defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. And is this... These are our missing daughters and sons. We need anyone who saw something to come forward. She was wearing a black jacket, a black top. I'm going to bring my son home alive. Dateline Missing in America. Listen now wherever you get your podcasts. Tonight, I interviewed Secretary of Transportation Pete Buttigieg about the ongoing delays. You seem to be pointing the finger at the airlines. They're pointing the finger back. Mr. Secretary, when is this going to get better? Mr. Secretary, when is this going to get better? You came into this job saying you were to fight crime. Have you been successful? Found a way to put that. Can you update us on the status of negotiations? Hallie Jackson now. Weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. You open the door for so many people. I love working with people. I did not do any of this by myself. Hello! Lizzo, you put a smile on yes. every single face. It feel like Christmas and my birthday or something. <laughs> Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson. Streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Michael Abels, uh, he, of course, scored this one. He scored Get Out. Uh, he's, he scored us. I interviewed him a few months ago. I've been a fan of his work for a long time. And he told the story of, of when you called to invite him on that first project. And he thought you were punking him. Uh, what, what, what is it about Michael and his style that has led you guys to work together so much? Well, it's so funny that he thought I was punking him because I, you know, I really, I had never directed a film when I first reached out to him on Get Out. And what, what I loved about his style is he, he has an ability to create new genres of, of music. And he can do it many times. You can sort of describe a new flavor of music and he can achieve that. No! They took him. They took him all. I'm trying to save you. My brother is out there. And uh, that's how I want my films to feel. I want it to feel like something you've never experienced. And so, <clears throat> you know, that, that's that's what he does. He's like he's like a, a you know he's like a Shaolin yeah. monk. You know? That's a great. I mean, and masterful. Just yeah. I mean, the music last night. You know, not to give away too much, but I, I feel like when you watch and you listen to a Jordan Peele film now you know and that it's a Jordan Peele film. Like, that's become one of the uh, hallmarks of it. I love that. I it's love true. that. You know, it's, I spend a lot of time uh, just focusing on this responsibility of trying to be a, a mirror for what comes in, you know? And, um, and so to, to hear at the end people say that they, they are, can see me in there in the cross section of these things, they sort of see me, I, I feel like, yeah, you, you do. Daniel Kaluuya, uh, you guys have become um, quite the dynamic duo. Um, mm -hmm. We came to know him and, and get out. We see him again here. Mm -hmm. um, what is it about working with Daniel that, that makes it so special? Uh, Daniel, I, you know, I've said it before, I'll say it again. He's my favorite actor um, to watch and, and to work with as well. He, he, we have a, a, a special, I mean, I, I believe he has this with any director he has, has this with, but we have a, a, a shorthand that is just, it's just the dream as a director, that you can have somebody and with very little words, it's like siblings, you know, very little words. We can come up to each, I can, we walk up after a scene, I can be like, you know that thing, but, mm, what? <laughs> you know, it's like one of those silent conversations yeah. and um, he's just, he's so committed. You know, he's so, so focused, such a professional. 
Um, yeah, man, that's my that's my uh, star. I want to talk about something. I, I want to ask you whether something informs your work, and if so, how how it does. You are a, a biracial man in America, white mom, black father, and and some of the themes that we've seen emerge in your films. It would seem from the outside, it would seem to be that 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 worldview informs your movie making in a, in a somewhat pronounced way. Is that accurate? And if so, how? You know, I mean, my, my race, I think, has informed my entire artistic <laughs> uh, journey. And, and part of it has been trying to reconcile um, the box and the boxes that um, this, the country um, puts people of color in and trying to break out of that box, what, those boxes, whatever, and trying to identify, what does this mean? What, you know, what, what, and so I think from an early on, you know, you see this pattern in my work, it is about um, digging, into, d digging into those boxes so I can shed them and break, break, break out of them. And so, you know, ever, you know, ever since I kind of started on that mission, I got into this pattern of just like, look, if I see a box, I'm gonna break it. If I see something I'm not supposed to do, I'm gonna do it. <laughs> and I'm gonna figure out how to make it work. When people leave the theater after they see this, this film, what do you want them to be thinking about? Not to think, but what do you want them to be thinking about? Mm. I mean, that's a great question. I, uh, you know, I mean, this is their turn. This is their time for their end of the conversation. You know, I think if I if I had too clear of an idea of what I wanted them to be thinking about, um, I think I I, I I feel like I wouldn't be having the, the conversation with the audience. You know, that's up to them. I want to hear. I want to know what they like. I said I I I feel like with Nope, we uh, you know we we described a, a feeling and we portrayed a feeling. And we brought a sense of magic and adventure out of what was a very dark place and, and very dark time. And um, so I, I, I hope that they are, I hope they're just fulfilled yeah. and, and glad they went out to see it at an IMAX, which by the way, IMAX. You used IMAX cameras for this, I read. Oh yeah, we used IMAX cameras. Again, very expensive. Oh, very expensive <laughs> stuff. You can't just, you know, but it makes, it, it, it's, I think it's the best way to watch the film. Yeah. Um, and, the, you know, the, the, the format is just immersive. It is. The whole thing with me is like, I wanted to make a flying saucer movie because I just felt like if we can feel like we are in the presence of something other, something, if we feel like that's real, then that's just an immersive, experience worthy of, of going to the movies. When Get Out came out, I read that the, at the time you said you had three or four more films like that, in the, of the horror genre. You had three of those, four of those, you had them in your pocket. But as you sit here now, you 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 say there 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 are more. So you weren't supposed to say. It. Oh, you were oh, saying, oh, no, oh. I'm kidding. Did I, did <laughs> I give it away? Oh no. No, you good. You good. <laughs> Look, I've got more. I, I'm not gonna have just one more film. Okay. I've got more now. No, of, it's of it's, the horror genre. You know, it, it, it's funny. You you bring up the horror genre. I would say yes because I'm always gonna be having you know scary things yeah. in my film. But I do like this. You know, uh, I I do like expanding. And I, I like working with the comedy. I like working with the adventure. Yeah. You know, I, uh, you know, genre is a thing to subvert. You like to bend the genre. Yeah. It's funny you mentioned that because there were a few times last night where I thought, oh, this, is, this, is, this is funny, this is thrilling, this is, do you consider this a horror film? Well, like I said, I, you know, I think it's, it's no. I, I, I do consider it a horror film in that horror is, it's my favorite genre, and I, I hope it, 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 it honors horror. I hope it's scary enough yeah. to um, make people say, talking about nope. Um, you know, at the same time, I, uh, yeah, I want, I want 
people to feel some other things besides fear as well. Let's put it that way. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Welcome back to you today. We've got a lot to celebrate on this Wednesday morning. It's good to have you along with us. You don't know when your moment's coming, but when it does, you take it. Everybody's good, and that's it! And what do you love about fatherhood? The chaos, the learning. Is climate change one of your top priorities? What's your message to girls who want to make a difference in their own communities? Believe in yourself. These are our missing daughters and sons. We need anyone who saw something to come forward. She was wearing a black jacket, a black top. I'm going to bring my son home alive. Dateline Missing in America. Listen now wherever you get your podcasts. Today is now a podcast available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. They're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No. Top Story with Tom Hamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. It's hard to believe Kiki Palmer is only 28 years old since her acting debut in Barbershop 2 nearly 20 years ago. Kiki has appeared in more than 60 TV shows and movies. Kiki starring in Jordan Peele's thriller Nope. She plays Emerald, who may have captured footage of a <laughs> UFO, which she and her brother are hoping to cash in on. Take a look. We don't just go for the quick cash in, okay? We, we go to the most credible platform to do the story. Was that like Oprah? Yeah. Like Oprah, for example. After that, everybody won in. But I'm saying there's plenty of videos of flying online. I saw one the other day that wasn't on Oprah. I didn't say Oprah. You said Oprah. You love Oprah. Like, all I'm saying is all that online is fake, low quality. Ain't nobody gonna get what we gonna get. What we gonna get? The shot. What shot? The shot. The money shot. Undeniable, singular, the, the Oprah shot. The Oprah shot? The Oprah shot. Come on out, Kiki. <laughs> Thank you for having Congratulations. me. Congratulations. Get the. Can you give a little French yeah. moment? Okay, first of all, you're looking beautiful. Shout out to wife, uh, Wayman Micah and Christopher John Rogers. Yes. He's such a talent, and so are you. I got Thank to you. watch. <sighs> This this film, which had me like both terrified and also um, laugh, yeah, laughing. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. Mean, it, he, first of all, Jordan Peele is a crazy talent. Yes. He is. But you are effervescent in this. Oh you shine gosh. so bright. What did it feel like to be part of it? Thank you so much. I mean, it feels so much fun. I mean, obviously, I'm a huge fan of Jordan, and this is like a different type of, of film that he's done before. Yeah. Um, the, the the style is yes. just really unique. Uh, but there's always this big overwhelming message. So for me, I was just focused on making sure that I was able to, you know, do what I needed to do yeah. to get the story told. Yeah, now, a lot of what's been pointed out about this film, it's that it's about what could be. How does this come out in this film? Oh, man, you know, I think that's the whole spectacle concept, right? right? Yeah. There's something that our, our, the two lead characters, myself and Daniel's brother and sister, they discover something in the sky. Yeah. And then they're on this journey, both for different reasons, of finding out what is it exactly. You know, Daniel's character, OJ, just is curious. And then my character's kind of like, what can we, how can we get ahead yeah. of this? How mm -hmm. can we exploit this? And through that journey, it's really just kind of more so an observation of how many of us in today's society are obsessed with outside things, yes. validation, exploiting, you know, yes. getting everything on footage, you know? Yeah. So, but let's be real. Kiki's in her backyard having a cocktail with her homegirls, <laughs> and she sees a UFO. Who is Kiki calling first? Honey, aside from talking to the girls that I'm with, yeah. I'm calling my mama. You know I'm on the computer, Sharon on the line? Sharon, you'll never believe what I just seen. That's always what goes down. We have to talk about your mom. Uh, we have this picture of you all in front of the oh. Nope billboard somewhere. Oh, my God. Hopefully. Oh, but also, it. I've read so much about how she sort of, there we are. Yeah. Like, how she made you feel like you could do anything. Absolutely. My mother, uh, my family has, uh, they've been such a great support system for me. And my mom specifically, you know, she and I both were always on this kind of road together. You know, thick as thieves, yeah. uh, battling throughout every ups and downs of this industry. Yeah. And so just for us to continue to have these new moments, even after 20 years, 
I think it just it, we're just feeling so blessed. I read your glamour cover story, which was so oh, profound because you beautiful. talked about saying no. Yeah. And the power of it, and and we yeah. and also like that you feel comfortable now being like, listen, like I'm gonna put up my own boundaries. Yeah. Like how does that how does that change? I think it could just get hard for us, right? I mean, especially as a child entertainer, you yeah. just always want to be so agreeable. Yeah. I think, mm -hmm. You know, I think it's a part and of, a woman. And you know what I mean? I think it's a part of maturing and saying it's okay to say no. I can't do this, and it's it's, it's like a big part of self love, and also knowing that you can give your best. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Yeah. Like I think that's the way that I help myself transition to understanding that it's okay to say no. Is that at the end of the day, all I want to do is do my best. And if I'm giving too much and I'm spread too thin, then how can I give yeah. my best? Yes. So that really made it easy for me to say, just say no, girl. Yeah. But how do you like, because I know a lot of actors in Hollywood think, go into it like, this could be the last job. Yeah. Exactly. And yes. how do you get over that fear of like, if you take a break, that it's not going to come back? Well, I'll tell you, I think it's just faith. It's faith, uh, you know, and that's something that we all are on our own personal journeys with, uh, whether it's a spiritual thing or just faith in yourself and to know that what's for me is truly for me. I remember there was something that Daniel said recently, I think it was a GQ uh, or Essence that he was talking to about how he had, you know, thought he was going to take a break from acting right before he did get out. Yeah. And he oh. took that break and then he met with Jordan and yes. ended up doing Get Out. And, you know, so I think it's, again, everybody should follow their instincts and know that if it's time for you to take a break, take a break. Just know that what's for you is always going to yeah. be for you. Yes. yes. And do you feel like, I mean, you said in, in this article that you're sort of in this next phase of your life. Yeah. Where you want to be with your nephews and your nieces. And you're thinking about, like, your personal life in a way that you've never thought about it before. Absolutely. Because, again, I started so young. It kind of the only, it, it's like a kid that starts doing football, you know, or, yeah. or basketball. Yeah. This is all I care about. Yeah. But then as time goes on, you, you the, you get more interest. You think about love. You think about family. You yeah. think about, oh, I missed the graduation. Or I missed the, mm -hmm. my, you know, so you start. <laughs> don't, no, Kiki, don't get baby fever on those kids, okay? So it's so true that yeah. you start caring about things that you really didn't, you know, you didn't yes. look at before. And I think, again, it's about balance. Yes. I think that's what I want more than anything in my life, you know, is to have the balance of, of all the things I want. Yeah. Ooh, so you're going to show us a picture of that man <laughs> in the commercial break. <laughs> oh, my God. What you going to do, guys? It's so <laughs> oh my much God. fun. Hey there, everyone, and welcome to Pop Star Plus. I'm Joe Fryer, filling in for Carson once again. Coming up on the show, Bonnie Hunt. She's doing it all as director, writer, and executive producer of a new series out this week. We've got her visit with our third hour friends, plus Euphoria, the buzzy show about a group of troubled teens raked up 16 Emmy nominations this year. We spoke with the cast about how their characters evolved this season. And we'll wrap things up with the late, great James Caan from our vault on one of his most iconic films, Misery. But first, here's today's pop start with Jacob. Let's do some pop start. All right, first up, we've got an exclusive first look at the upcoming Princess Diana documentary, simply called The Princess. The film's going to give viewers an intimate look at Diana's life and how her relationship with Prince Charles came under intense scrutiny from the media and the public. Watch us. The princess has been the best thing that happened to the monarchy in centuries. Did you get a chance to see her? Yes! Diana is very big news everywhere. She's got the common touch. The prince realizes that he's taking second place. By the way. <laughs> a hollow and tormented marriage are giving the British media and its public little else to talk about. Please give me one question, right? No. She's been pushed from the word go. It's the media that's causing the problems. Please. Leave them alone. Should this mean so much to us? Can't sweep her under the carpet. Intense, right? Ooh, I have anxiety. Wow. Amazing. Oh, I know. Wow. I can't wait to watch that one. So, Prin Princess premieres on HBO the 13th of August. Okay. So, can't wait for that one. Yeah. Uh, coming up next, uh, any Dawson's Creek fans? <laughs> yes. Raise your hands. I love the Dawson's Creek. Uh, we got some news on a possible revival of the popular 90s teen drama that starred Katie Holmes and James Vanderbeek, Michelle Williams, Joshua Jackson. The news is this is not fair. It's likely never going to happen. <laughs> oh, why did All right. Bring it up. I don't know. I just wanted to let you guys know. Uh, Holmes was asked whether she would like to return to the role that made her a household name. She had some disappointing news for fans. This is what she said. I think it's great that you're nostalgic for it. So am I. But it's like, do we want to see them not at that age? I don't know. I don't think so. We all decided we don't, actually. 
So okay, there you go. Pretty that's pretty definitive. definitive. I don't want to know what happened to them. See, like, as a doll. Did you love Katie Holmes? Oh, my Come gosh. on. Yeah, yeah, that was your crush. crush. I would go that over your school. crush. I'd be like, what is happening? <laughs> <laughs> it was so good. Uh, okay, next up, Lizzo. Uh, how was the show? It was an inc absolutely incredible. Fresh off uh, being here and her hit song about damn time, hitting number one on the Billboard Hot 100. The music superstar is revealing just how many times she recorded that song's chorus to make it perfect. She posted a TikTok video of the moment that she nailed it with members of her team celebrating. Check it out. Huh. The moment I finally figured out the chorus to about damn time. Let's celebrate. I got a feeling I'm gonna be okay. Okay. That's so cool. <laughs> Is that oh, amazing? That's awesome. Is that amazing? That's so fun. she wrote in the caption, we literally had 50 versions of this song. I never thought we'd finish it, oh. but it was worth it. Can you imagine being in that room? Do you remember when she was here, I won't forget, when she was greeting all the people in the crowd and this little girl looked at her and said, I love you, Lizzo. And Lizzo said, I love you. But do you love you? Oh, oh. she said yes. I was Whoa. like, I love that Lizzo. Oh She's amazing. Gosh. I bet that kid will never forget that moment. Yeah, I, had, I was texting all of you. I had fun about that day. That was yeah. like one That's of the good great Also, the here. entire yeah. album is great. Yeah, that is great. Album yeah. every track. Well, if it wasn't enough, she also showed a video uh, showing off a bouquet of flowers, by the way, that Harry Styles <gasps> sent her way as a congratulations Aww. about damn time. It actually surpassed, dethroned as it was oh, on the billboard. Oh, his song. Yeah. Oh, that's okay. classic. I love Harry Styles. Mm -hmm. All right, coming up next, have you ever been watching Seinfeld? This is all about me, guys. <laughs> uh, and thought to yourself, boy, I wish I could have that marble rye bread or that famous big salad. Yeah. Well, now you can, thanks to the release of the official <laughs> oh, Seinfeld cookbook. No. Yes, it features recipes from some of the show's oh classic God. food moments, from the black and white yeah. cookie to the infamous soup Nazis, what? Mola Gatani. Um, uh... <laughs> oh, 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 one Mola Gatani, and, um, you know what? Does, has anyone ever told you you look exactly like Al Pacino? You know, scent of a woman. <laughs> Very good. Very good. You know something? No soup for you! Come back. One year. One year. One year. One year. No soup for you. Yosef was so excited for that one. I said Mulgatani. He's like, Sign we're doing Seinfeld? Uh, you don't have to worry about following the soup Nazis rules because you can make the Mulgatani right awesome. at home. Wow. So October 11th, cool. the cookbook okay. comes out, so That's go pick fun. that one so up. Fun. Okay, last but not least, the most unexpected story of the morning. Aaron Rodgers <laughs> rolled in the Packers training camp this week looking like a movie, actually like a movie character. Look, here he is walking into camp, rocking long hair, <laughs> oh. a beard, a white tank top, light blue jeans. Does he remind you of anybody? Nick Cage. Nick Cage, oh, Nick baby, Cage. Con Air. Packers fans and yeah. Nick Cage fans <laughs> caught on pretty quickly. He was channeling Cage's character, wow. Cameron Poe, right. from the 1997 Con Air. Con Air. Yep. It was no coincidence. He posted photos of Cage on his own Instagram, too, so he did this on purpose. And it's not the first time he's done something like this. Last season, Rogers grew out his hair a lot, and it turns out it was for his Halloween costume. So he went as Keanu Reeves, uh, John Wick, complete with the dog and everything. So wow. he commits. He commits, he commits. yeah. Wow. All right. Uh, that's your pop that's star, it. guys. Yeah, I won't take it. I know, we're you like, want, we want more. more. Guys, can we get a couple more? Yeah. yeah. Hey, well, way to go. Way to go, Jake. <laughs> We've got one more pop star story for you this morning. Get ready for more Ryan Gosling and The Gray Man. The Netflix action film may have just premiered on Netflix, but a sequel starring Gosling is already in the works from the same directors. Not only that, but it seems the streamer is trying to turn this into a whole sort of spy cinematic universe with a spin-off being worked on as well. The Gray Man follows Gosling's CIA agent character as he's hunted by assassins across the globe Looks like audiences liked what they were seeing with a reported 88 million hours viewed over the weekend. That's a huge number for Netflix. And those are your Pop Start Plus headlines. Still to come, Bonnie Hunt's visit to the third hour. Stay with us. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. You open the door for so many people. I love working with people. I did not do any of this by myself. Hello. Lizzo, you put a smile on yes. every single face. It feel like Christmas and my birthday or something. <laughs> and what do you love about fatherhood? The chaos, the learning. Is climate change one of your top priorities? What's your message to girls who want to make a difference in their own communities? Believe in yourself. It's a can't miss summer on today. Ah! 
like they are walking strong. Elegant and pretty easy to prepare. How to cut costs on your vacation. Vicky has the answers. Every single thing you need for the best summer yet. Only on Today. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now? What it all means for you for an hour every day? It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Allie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Allie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. They're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No. Top Story with Don Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Welcome back to Pop Start Plus. Bonnie Hunt wears many hats in the new Apple TV Plus show Amber Brown. Executive producer, director, writer, and showrunner. And she dropped by the third hour to chat about the new project. Our next guest is an Emmy and Golden Globe nominated actor who has starred on the big and small screen. Ah, uh, yes, Bonnie Hunt rolled some magical dice in the original Jumanji. Then she took multitasking to another level as a mom of 12 and cheaper by the dozen. And for her latest project, Bonnie's behind the camera directing the new Apple TV Plus series Amber Brown about a young girl navigating life after her parents' divorce. Here's a look. <laughs> You sure you're fine with spending the night somewhere else, away from home, even with school the next morning? Yes, absolutely, for sure. <laughs> and I can wear these PJs that Dad sent me. <laughs> I mean, wear them, like, show up in them. Cute, right? Yes, it's <laughs> very sweet. Oh, I'm so excited! Cutie. Bonnie, good morning to you. Good it's morning. so good to see you. You too, Jake. You know what I want to do? I want to say hi to Ashley first, who's Thank watching you. us right now, your niece. Yep. Say good morning to you and good morning to Ashley. We know she's a big fan. Yes, you, and Ashley. she's, you know, a cancer patient right now, my beautiful niece, and she's in the emergency room watching us because her white count is up. All the cancer patients out there know what I'm talking about when you're going through chemo and you have that white count go up. It's a little scary, but... Um, well, we hope we can be a yes. little hug for her in the morning. Yes, That's and, great, and all right? of you, anybody out there fighting it, you know, yeah. just know you're a warrior and um, our energy is with you, mine Absolutely. and Ashley's. Sending good. lots of love to you, Absolutely. Ashley. Yeah. All right, so let's talk about Amber Brown. We're very excited. Mm -hmm. And it's based on a book series, as I mentioned, uh, a girl's going through a lot of changes in her life, including a, her parents' divorce. What else? Tell us a little more. Well, it's really about, I mean, just talking about my niece, you know, I have a bunch of nieces and nephews, and of course, I'm close to all of them. Ashley was born when I was working at Second City mm -hmm. back in the days, and uh, my whole family's been a big part of the show, because so much of it is personal for me, even though it's based on the books from Paula Danzinger. The family was kind enough to let me explore and heighten the characters and bring them into present day. And Amber, the whole show is for the whole family. Mm -hmm. um, we were talking about it before we were on the air. Just, uh, Actually, I try to write from my heart and with humor, like I, my mom instilled in me. And I, not. it's been so much fun to kind of share my family's sense of humor and love through this series. And I hope it touches it people. Comes through. We talked a little bit about your mom. We're so sorry to hear of your loss. I know how close you are, but I know that it was important to her for you to address family, different mm. issues in family. And would yeah. she have just love oh, this so much? Oh, there's mom there with is. her pies. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. It, you know, I'm, um, I think a part of me will always be grieving the loss of my mom. Mm. Sorry. Oh. But, um, yeah, I mean, I'm I'm inspired by her constantly, and she'd always talk to me about the ripple effect. You know, you're a storyteller, Bonnie. Remember the ripple effect. Be mindful, because what you put out there has an effect on people. You're doing it. So I was watching it yesterday, and it's the kind of show you can watch with your kids, and it's okay. It feels like a safe space. Yeah. Talk to me about this Amber Brown, this main mm -hmm. character. She had me at hello. Yeah. She is, I was just like, where did they find this little girl? Yeah. Well, adorable. you know, we had a great casting team, brought us everybody, and I was telling you before the break that, I mean, before we were on that um, we didn't put any descriptions of our characters you know we just said mother daughter just that kind of thing and a, and a personality and we were able to see so many people and then we you know the minute Carson was on screen my mom was actually That's her name, Carson Carson Rose so and mom and I were watching on zoom you know I was doing all the auditions on zoom at that time during right. the pandemic and Carson came on the screen and my mom and I looked at each other just when she was just talking because I always talk to the kids mm -hmm. instead of have them just read the script and yeah was, she was delightful and charismatic and authentic and she could feel the heart of the character and that Great. was most important to me and she's phenomenal 
Bonnie, sorry, but I got to go through your IMDb because <laughs> we've got so you many. You and every guy on the so, planet. <laughs> <laughs> so many good ones. Dave, Jerry Maguire. Yeah. Uh, you had your own TV show. You had your own daytime talk show. We were thinking, is there something? When are you going to finally you? succeed? For, oh, no, <laughs> like, stop. Give me a break. What's stick? Is there, what ties it all together for you? Ooh. Uh, storytelling and and the how magical uh, storytelling is. When I, you know, I'm an oncology nurse, former oncology nurse, but I still work as a volunteer advocate. And my time at the hospital, I would see people facing their own mortalities. And in a moment, we would watch something on TV together, and I'd see them completely free for mm. a second. Mm. And I realized, even as a child, my dad would watch the Andy Griffith show, all of a sudden the pressure of having seven children and being a blue collar guy, he'd be laughing and escape right. for a moment. So that's really powerful. And I hope my writing, whether it was Return to Me, which I wrote, or all my talk shows or TV shows, whatever it is, my energy is, oh, can I have that effect on somebody at home right now? Escape, so. You right? do, you Good. do. Man, it's great oh, to spend right time with you. It's so Bonnie. great to see you here. Yes. Yeah, Bonnie, thank you so much. Everybody, Amber Brown debuts on Apple TV Plus this Friday. You got to go check it out. Great to hear from Bonnie. Up next, Zendaya and her euphoria castmates. And what do you love about fatherhood? The chaos, the learning. Is climate change one of your top priorities? What's your message to girls who want to make a difference in their own communities? Believe in yourself. It's a can't miss summer on today. Ah! They are walking strong, elegant, and pretty easy to prepare. How to cut costs on your vacation. Vicky has the answers. Every single thing you need for the best summer yet. Only on today. Uvalde, Texas, a small town that has become yet another landmark. How long do you think it took for all this damage to occur? Can you tell us what, what it was like? With our NBC News exclusive. The midterms are here. It's time to plan your vote. We'll provide everything you need to know to successfully cast your ballot. Just select any state you want to learn about for the primary or general election, and you'll instantly get voting rules, see the next big deadline, and learn how to take action for your plan. Voting rules have changed since 2020, and those rules vary from state to state. So it's time to get planning for 2022. Visit NBCNews.com slash plan your vote today. Allie Jackson now. Weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. They're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Allie Jackson now. Weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. We are back with a fan favorite. Euphoria did especially well with this year's Emmy nominations. The show tallied 16 in all, including a Best Actress nod for star Zendaya. We spoke to her and the rest of the cast about how their high school characters navigate addiction, identity, love, and more in the most recent season. I had to choose three words to describe Euphoria. A lot of words that could describe euphoria, but chaotic, funny, and honest. Painful, tiring, love. Listen, it's a it's a very different season, to be honest. I mean, um, tonally, it's different. Um, I think it's far more emotional than the first season. Um, I think it's got much like the film stock that we use this season, which is also different. Um, it's it's high contrast, meaning the highs are high, the lows are low. And when it's funny, it's really funny. And when it's painful, it's really painful. I think uh, they're in a kind of tough position just because after they're falling out at the end of season one, Rue relapses as we find out very quickly. And 
Jules isn't in the loop and doesn't know. While they do like reconvene, um, there's like a lot under the surface that will most likely bubble up and bring the former issues to surface again, which is going to be tough for them because I think like surface level feelings, they just want to be like cute couple, but you know, it's, it's more complicated than that. I think Leslie is that tough love mom. You know, she loves her girls. She'll do anything for them. And unfortunately, she finds herself in the thick of Rue's addiction. And she she wants to save her daughter. But unfortunately, sometimes those situations, the person has to make up their own mind to become sober and to become clean and to want to be better. And I think Leslie is doing everything she can. So we see her kind of make some hard decisions and I think I think Leslie is just your ride or die mom. She's like, look, we, we're gonna we're gonna get through this together. So, you slept over last night. Yeah. So, are you two in a relationship? Mm, yeah, kinda. I think with all of the characters, I am um, lucky enough or blessed enough to be able to to step in their shoes. I try to do just that. I try to become them and, and really uh, try to tell their story. But with Gia specifically, I think it's just been us kind of growing up together where I was around 15 when we were shooting the first season and now I'm 18. But there has been growth and there has been more understanding of what Rue is going through and her addiction and her mental health. But Gia has to realize that she is human and she has the right to not neglect her own feelings and all of this. So I think we, we get to see her grow up and I've grown up with her. So um, I've just been, been super duper grateful that I have been able to play a character um, that is so real and is so grounded and that isn't perfect. So um, I'm lucky. My face are like the big moments in life. Like my mom always talks about how high school is like this big monumental part of her life. And I cannot imagine being 40 and looking back at this like, wow. I think one of my most favorite parts of playing Cassie, her choices are very unexpected. And I enjoy the challenge of going on a roller coaster with a character like that. So yes, it's a challenge, but I find that part the most fun. My favorite part about playing Maddie is I have a lot of fun with Maddie. I think she can be such a fun character, you know, when she's in her element and in her feminine power. I think a challenging part about playing Maddie is everything that she has to, just everything she has to go through is heartbreaking. I get a little too connected sometimes. The most challenging part about playing Ali is in the beginning, it was to not be seduced, to feel like you have to be a part of that bigger picture of the other craziness and all that. But I can actually be a bit more grounded. And I think to understand that that's my engine. It is not to play all these big notes of emotion and all that, but it's actually to be a bit more restrained. And so that was a challenge, to be honest. Every actor asks, w wishes to be written with such dimension and colors and arc for a whole episode mm -hmm. and calls on their, their strengths and calls on things that they feel very close to. And I think it was this great symbiosis actually, that great gift that Sam gave me. Um, and so that's been my greatest gift. And I feel like the effect of it has been a gift that keeps on giving on how it's affecting people's lives and people saying, I feel like I'm not alone. Or I feel like you reached out a hand to me or I listen to, I watch it over and over again, because it's it's going to my soul and helping me get through these dark spaces. So that's the gift that I've been given. It's an honor to be a part of uh, creating a piece of art in such a huge collaboration and every moving part, you know, it's just insane the scale of, of what we're doing. The trip, yeah. You know, you can't even put that feeling into words.
It's incredible. I feel incredibly grateful to me when people have come up to, to me at least, and shared their stories, whether it be of sobriety or other entry points to different characters that they feel connected to emotionally. That's when I'm like, you know, this, this is worth it. Like what we're doing means something to somebody and that's all we could ever really hope for. That's the point, you know, that's the purpose. If you haven't watched or want to watch again, you can catch up on Euphoria on HBO. Still to come, we are remembering James Caan with a moment from our vault on one of his greatest films, Misery. Good evening from New Orleans. Nice to really spend some time with you. Appreciate it. You open the door for so many people. I love working with people. I did not do any of this by myself. Hello! Lizzo, you put a smile on yes. every single face. It felt like Christmas and my birthday or something. <laughs> Uvalde, Texas, a small town that has become yet another landmark. How long do you think it took for all this damage to occur? Can you tell us what, what it was like? With our NBC News exclusive. It's a can't-miss summer on today. Bam! They are walking strong, elegant, and pretty easy to prepare. How to cut costs on your vacation. Vicki has the answers. Every single thing you need for the best summer yet. Only on today. Welcome back to Pop Start Plus. The entertainment world was shaken when James Caan passed away earlier this month at the age of 82. Today, we'd like to remember his great acting legacy. He visited today back in 1990 to talk about his film, Misery, starred alongside Kathy Bates, who went on to win an Oscar for her performance. Over the years, the books of Stephen King have made for some pretty scary movies, among them The Shining, Carrie, Salem's Lot, Cujo, Firestarter, Creepshow. The latest edition of the list is called Misery. It opens nationwide this week. And our man in Hollywood, Jim Brown, says it brings together an unlikely mix of talents. If it were a true story, it would end up on the front pages of supermarket tabloids. Headlines screaming, celebrity author terrorized by biggest fan. But it's only fiction. It's misery from the mind of best-selling novelist Stephen King and brought to the movie screen by writer William Goldman and director Rob Reiner. The romance novelist turned prisoner is James Caan, whose film credits include Cinderella Liberty, Funny Lady, Comes a Horseman, Gardens of Stone, and of course, his Oscar-nominated performance as Sonny Corleone in the original Godfather. Kathy Bates plays his number one fan, Nurse Annie Wilkes, who goes from sympathetic lifesaver to sociopathic demon. I want my pain to go away, Annie. Please, make it go away. I think it was a sadistic joke by Rob. You know, he says, let's get the most hyper guy in Hollywood. <laughs> let's get Jimmy and tie him down, you know. You know, ha, ha, ha. You know, every morning he would laugh. How, how about this scene you get in bed, Jimmy, you know. So, yeah, that's, that, it, it became, of all the, the pics I've done, and I've done a lot of physical things, you know. And I, but this was the most physical demanding, physically demanding, uh, picture because of that, you know, because I was forced not to move. This subject of uh, of the obsessive fan, have you ever encountered anything even remotely like this or known any actor who has? I've really not had uh, any anything remotely close to, to this or anything that touched on uh, on violence. Plus, you know, who's going to fool around with Sonny Corleone? You know what I mean? That's the way they <laughs> hey, what are you gonna do? 
Nice college boy, huh? They want to get mixed up in the family business? Huh? Now you want to gun down a police captain, why? Because he slapped you in the face a little bit? Huh? What do you think, this is the army where you shoot them a mile away? You got to get up close like this, and bing you blow their brains all over your nice side relief suit. James Caan was Sonny Corleone in Francis Ford Coppola's masterful version of the novel The Godfather. Caan, along with Al Pacino and Robert Duvall, were nominated for supporting Oscars, but lost to Joel Grey in Cabaret. Khan also lost out for any chance to grow old with other members of the family when his character was killed off in spectacular fashion. Now, with Coppola's Godfather 3 due in theaters next month, Khan, who also worked for Coppola in The Rain People and Gardens of Stone, wished the movie maker well. Oh, I have nothing but well wishes for, for Godfather 3. You know, Francis uh, Coppola, of course, has been a friend for a long, long time. And uh, I always root for him. Uh, I don't think they need much help. I don't think they need my wishes even. I think it'll be just great. And there was Rocket Man trying to get out. And here comes the cliff. And just before the car went off the cliff, he jumped free. Meanwhile, James Caan has his own problems with the dilemma provided by Kathy Bates in Misery, which opens this week. Too much is to say that as they hope for an audience, Misery loves company. No, shouldn't do that. 56 pass. James Kahn, such a legend, we're thinking of his family and his friends. That does it for this edition of Pop Start Plus. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Join us again tomorrow for more. We'll see you then. You see them? I'm happy they're here. Our yeah. friends. This is today in 30. It's Wednesday. Tom's in for Savannah. We're happy y'all are here. Hey, guys. We're starting the show off with a report from Tom Costello in Washington, where the Fed is set to raise interest rates again. Will this latest hike be enough to avoid a recession? And what will it mean for your bottom line? Everything you need to know straight ahead. And then we're taking you to this cool coastal island where the adorable Puffin is making a remarkable comeback. Carrie Sanders got a first-hand look. Yeah, we look forward to that. And also ahead, our friends at the third hour caught up with the always lovely Bonnie Hunt about her new TV series. All that plus, JBH and I were off on another adventure. This time, we are hitting one of the most iconic hot spots in New York City. Coney Island. Did you guys ride the roller coaster? You'll have to wait oh, to see. Oh, wow. Okay. Now that I've got to see <laughs> how all this works, let's get to this episode starting. It's time for Today, Today in 30. 30. We've got two reports to break it all down with everything you need to know. NBC's Tom Costello's in D.C. to get us started. Hey, Tom, good morning. Yeah, good morning. So we've been talking about this inflation problem for months, 41-year high inflation. And as you know, consumer confidence fell for the third month in a row because... Consumers are paying for inflation, of course, every single day. We do expect the Fed to raise interest rates today to try to get it under control. But is the economy close to recession? And if the Fed does, in fact, raise rates by as much as three quarters of a point, could it nudge the economy further into recession? At stake this morning, your credit card rates, new car and bank loans, even new mortgage rates are influenced by what the Federal Reserve does today. Widely expected to raise rates yet again, perhaps by three quarters of a percentage point. The fastest, most aggressive series of rate hikes since 1994. The Fed has never had to face uh, this kind of inflation battle, which is driven not by uh, an overheating economy, but an economy that's suffering from log jams tied to a global pandemic. The expected move comes as consumer confidence has fallen to its lowest level in more than a year, with Americans still paying more for utilities, clothes, food, and gas. But is the economy already on a collision course for a recession? It depends on who you ask. The most important question economically 
is uh, whether uh, working people and middle class families have more breathing room and they're able to afford the important things in their lives. For Josanne English in Sacramento, it feels more like a depression. She lost her six figure salary career, then her savings and her home. Now she's living paycheck to paycheck. I don't see that there's a light at the end of the tunnel yet. I mean, I'm just struggling to get by and it's hard to stay positive. The National Bureau of Economic Research defines a recession as a significant decline in economic activity spread across the economy, lasting more than a few months. And while overall prices are high, experts say the job market is actually a bright spot, with unemployment sitting near 50-year lows. You actually believe the economy is relatively healthy or strong right now? Yes. I don't see the big signals of recession, mainly because I'm looking at the labor market. Everybody who wants a job can find a job in this economy, and that's not typically a characteristic that you see in a recession. And that right there is why this economy is such a head scratcher for the Federal Reserve. It doesn't feel like that we are on or in a recession for most people. By the way, also watching corporate earnings, Microsoft lighter than expected on the revenue side. We did, however, hear from Coca-Cola and uh, McDonald's, both of them had surprisingly good numbers. Guys, back to you. All right, Tom, thank you. Let's bring in CNBC's Melissa Lee, host of Fast Money. Melissa, good morning. Currently, inflation's almost 9%. The Fed wants it to get down to 3%. Here we go with another rate hike. Is anything making a dent in those numbers? We have seen prices come down, uh, Hoda. We know that the national average of gasoline went from $5 to where it is right now, somewhere in the $4 range, depending on where you are. So things are coming down. The question is whether or not the Fed rate hikes have really taken effect yet. There's oftentimes a lag effect in terms of when the Fed hikes interest rates and when those uh, effects take place. And also, there's only so many things that the Fed can actually control. A lot of the factors contributing to this high inflation, uh, the war in Ukraine, COVID lockdown, in China affecting supply chain issues, drought in the Midwest affecting farms and food prices. Those are things, last I checked, the Fed has no control over. Um, and so it can use the tools it has in its toolbox, but they are blunt tools. That tool is mm -hmm. rising interest rates, rate, hiking rates at this point. Yeah, and inflation, as you see, is a, is a big global problem. I keep thinking about people who are in their 60s. They're about to retire. They've planned. They've done every single thing right. And all of a sudden, here comes this big hammer, and it's hitting them right now. Is there any economic advice for them? I think uh, stick to your plan. If you do have that plan in place, that plan was made with this in mind. If you have a little bit longer of a time frame, um, think about getting your nest egg together. You always say save for a rainy day. The rainy day could be just around the corner because whether or not we are in a recession right now, the Federal Reserve has already told us, the American people, that unemployment will in fact tick higher. We will see more, for more uh, jobs lost here in this effort to battle inflation. So be prepared for that possibility that you could lose your job, get the six months of savings into your bank account. And keep in mind, for the longer term, stocks are the only way you're going to be able to beat inflation in terms of savings. And lastly, I keep hearing this debate. Are we in a recession? Are we not in a recession? We see it every single day. But if you're Mary Smith walking down the street with your kids going to work, does it matter what they label it? Does it affect them? No. I mean, if you're paying 12 percent more for food versus a year ago, and and that 12% number, that's just a headline number. A lot of Americans are paying a lot more for particular items. A 13-ounce bag of regular Lay's potato chips, that's up 38% over the past year. So Mary Smith walking down the street is feeling it very, very deeply, much more so than the headline numbers that the government issues. All right, we'll see what happens here with the rate hike today. Melissa at NASDAQ, thank you so much. In case you have not been glued to your phone lately, you may not have noticed, but the world of social media is undergoing some really big changes. Facebook and Instagram are testing moves that will allow them to compete better with the Internet's fastest rising star, TikTok. Our tech correspondent, Jake Ward, is here to break it down. Good morning, Jake. Jake, this is a huge deal. Good morning. That's absolutely right. I mean, from 2019 to 2021, TikTok went from 500 million users, that's pretty impressive, to over a billion, a startlingly fast rise. Now, Facebook and Instagram have clearly noticed, and now they are chasing its success, which means the social media that you are used to, well, it may never be the same again. 
This morning, some of the world's most influential social media platforms responding to backlash from users, influencers, and even celebrities. Facebook has always been about friendships and connections. Instagram lets you see your friends' pictures. But now, those experiences may be changing. Facebook is testing a major redesign, showing posts based on your interests and an algorithm instead of posts that connect you with your inner circle. And Instagram drawing the most attention. The app originally known for artful photos now focusing on video. Introducing a full screen feed where photos and videos take up the whole screen. And including recommendations of other users' posts in your feed as well as friends and contacts. Now, powerful users are pushing back. While people love video, they kind of say there's like a time and a place for that. Some point out the app now feels more like TikTok, the trend-setting platform popular with younger users. Kylie Jenner and Kim Kardashian, who hold some of the most popular Instagram accounts, both reposted this meme to their hundreds of millions of followers, imploring the platform to stop trying to be TikTok. User reaction was so strong it forced Masseri to respond. There's a lot going on in Instagram right now. We're experimenting with a number of different changes to the app. And so we're hearing a lot of concerns from all of you. I need to be honest. I do believe that more and more of Instagram is going to become video over time. An Instagram spokesperson stressing to NBC News, the changes are, quote, just a test, and that Instagram is still where your friends and interests meet to push culture forward. But that may be part of the problem. In a lot of ways, Instagram has made the same mistake that Facebook made, which is trying to be too many things to too many people and losing focus along the way. TikTok was the most downloaded app in 2021 and through the first quarter of 2022, a growth largely fueled by Gen Z users born in the late 1990s and early 2000s. TikTok is so attention grabbing that after too much scrolling, it actually encourages some users to take a break. Meta, formerly known as Facebook, seems to want to be that captivating, but it faces a dilemma. Stay relevant or stay true to what it was. We've heard people say, I want Instagram to be Instagram. I want Facebook to be Facebook. Now, something to note here, as Facebook rolls out its changes later this year, the company says it will provide a way for users to still see all those updates from family and friends chronologically in a separate feed. Now, Facebook has not responded to our request for comment. I think anybody who has Instagram has seen, like, suddenly your feed went to the people you know and love yeah. to, like, a ton of other people. That you don't know. You and you're this, constantly, you, like you might like that, Xing it out. So people are complaining about what's going on, people who love the old Instagram. Yes. Is there any way that Instagram's going to say, okay, Okay, maybe you are right. Let's go back to the way it was. You know, so Adam Masseri comes out, the head of Instagram, comes yeah. out and says, you know, we're going to respect the heritage of Instagram, which was photos, <laughs> right? And he uses the word heritage. Yeah. You know, but but you have to keep in mind, right, that these are companies and they yeah. are about growth. Yeah. And they have seen this other company, TikTok, come up with this entirely yeah. different model. Yeah. And their model is teaching us to perform for strangers is oh, really what TikTok is about. Yeah. And it seems like that is where these others are going to go. And that's going to transform a whole generation's worth of behavior. Here's what makes me notice or nervous. I find myself at night before I go to bed, I'll say, let me just see what's going on. Right. Yeah. I'll keep scrolling, yeah, it's oh, the especially most addictive on Reels. Feature. It's the most addictive so feature. I'll just admit right here, uh, you know, uh, I am one of those TikTok users who gets so sucked in that I literally get a video that says, you should go to bed now. From what? TikTok, it says, stop. Who You've do they give that long. to? How long? <laughs> I'm in the top, on. whatever that is, 1% oh, or whatever that goodness. is. And that is just how compulsive it is. And that's why, of course, Instagram and Facebook are looking at this and say, we need to be just that captivating. Jake, wow. the first step is admitting you have a problem. <laughs> this is what I do. <laughs> <laughs> this is what I do. I it's have for your problem. job. You're doing it for your yeah. job. Yeah. Don't that's forget. Right. For sure. your job. All right, Jake, thank you. These are our missing daughters and sons. We need anyone who saw something to come forward. She was wearing a black jacket, a black top. I'm going to bring my son home alive. Dateline Missing in America. Listen now wherever you get your podcasts. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Allie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Live from Ukraine, from Uvalde, Texas, from Mayfield, Kentucky. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. You can actually see they're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No. Do you remember any tornado as bad as this one? You look at this and you're thinking, we're not going to have power for weeks, if not months. Exactly. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Now Tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now.
To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. They're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No, top story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Today is now a podcast available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson. Streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. All right, we are back now with our ongoing series, Today Climate. This morning, a comeback story in the making. Yeah, last year, things were not looking very good for, for puffins, but the Atlantic puffin you see right here appears to be making a triumphant return. That's great news. NBC's Carrie Sanders visited one of the five islands off the coast of Maine where you'll find puffin colonies, and he joins us now from Sandy Point State Park in Maryland with the details. This is good news, Carrie. It is. Good morning, guys. Look, we're here. This is a popular place for bird watchers to come to see the coastal birds. But indeed, this is a story about Mother Nature overcoming changes to the climate. So we're talking about the puffin, that iconic bird, which, you know, is on hats, makes for little popular toys, and of course is even sold on shirts. But in real life, they've been having a little bit of a struggle, especially last year. But this year, they appear to be making a comeback, in part because of some protected islands off the coast of Maine where they are thriving. The Atlantic puffin, one of nature's rare and beloved species. And to get this close up to these remarkable seabirds in the state of Maine first requires an adventure. Our journey begins with Don Lyon, it's isolated who runs Audubon's Puffin Project. It's a bumpy eight miles east into the Gulf of Maine to Eastern Egg Rock Island, the southernmost puffin nesting grounds. Push off, here we go. So I can smell that this is Bird Island. Once on the island, we're greeted with nature's chaos. So this is incredibly active here. What are we seeing? We have common terns and arctic terns. Terns and other seabirds share the island with the nesting puffins that we've come to see. We're seeing adult puffins. Adult puffins. It's hard to look away. I don't know whether it's just me. I look at a puffin and I kind of want to giggle. I mean, it looks like it's a a toucan and maybe a penguin. It is not just you. Almost everyone finds puffins adorable, really intriguing, fascinating. Even me, I'm a data-driven scientist, but I love looking at puffins. Three months in, four research biologists have camped here with a laser focus on the puffins that are now prospering. Okay, if I join you. From the blinds where biologists observe feeding patterns, a slight shift this year over last year. It was a big worry. A prolonged heat wave here had warmed the ocean. So when adult puffins fed their chicks, they hunted fish not usually found in these cold northern waters. The butterfish. When puffins bring back butterfish, the chicks can't swallow that down very easily. Because? Because they're so big and they're so round. <laughs> Adult puffins this year are finding the food chicks prefer, which are thin-bodied herring. But they're farther from shore, and when nearby, they're deeper, where the water is colder, as much as 50 feet down. They fly underwater. They use their wings to propel themselves both in the air when they're flying and when they're swimming underwater. And they're chasing the fish? They chase down fish and grab them with that impressive bill. And the burrows go quite far back. This year, some good news. The chicks, which have hatch and burrow deep between the rocks appear to be on the rebound. What do we have here? This is actually a baby puffling. Uh, puffling? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Their term for a baby puffin. Can I touch? Yeah. It's so soft. This hatchling, about 10 days old. It's actually really promising. You're hopeful. I, I am. Hopeful, despite climate change, say researchers, because protected island habitats like this give puffins the opportunity to thrive. With their black and white penguin-like bonnies and their colorful parrot-like beaks, the puffins are living up to their nickname, the clowns of the sea. These are our missing daughters and sons. We need anyone who saw something to come forward. She was wearing a black jacket, a black top. I'm going to bring my son home alive. Dateline Missing in America. Listen now wherever you get your podcasts. The midterms are here. It's time to plan your vote. 
We'll provide everything you need to know to successfully cast your ballot. Just select any state you want to learn about for the primary or general election, and you'll instantly get voting rules, see the next big deadline, and learn how to take action for your plan. Voting rules have changed since 2020, and those rules vary from state to state. So it's time to get planning for 2022. Visit NBCNews.com slash plan your vote today. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. It's a can't-miss summer on today. Ah! They are walking strong, elegant, and pretty easy to prepare. How to cut costs on your vacation. Vicki has the answers. Every single thing you need for the best summer yet. Only on today. Live from Ukraine, from Uvalde, Texas, from Mayfield, Kentucky. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. You can actually see they're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. Now, do you remember any tornado as bad as this one? You look at this and you're thinking, we're not going to have power for weeks, if not months. Exactly. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Now Tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Our next guest is an Emmy and Golden Globe nominated actor who has starred on the big and small screens. Ah, yes, Bonnie Hunt rolled some magical Whoa. dice in the original Jumanji. Then she took multitasking to another level as a mom of 12 and cheaper by the dozen. And for her latest project, Bonnie's behind the camera directing the new Apple TV Plus series Amber Brown about a young girl navigating life after her parents' divorce. Here's a look. <laughs> You sure you're fine with spending the night somewhere else, away from home, even with school the next morning? Yes, absolutely, for sure. <laughs> and I can wear these PJs that dad sent me. <laughs> I mean, wear them, like, show up in them. Cute, right? Yes, it's <laughs> very sweet. Oh, I'm so excited. Cutie. Bonnie, good morning to you. Good it's morning. so good to see you. You too, Jake. You know what I want to do? I want to say hi to Ashley first, who's Thank watching you. us right now, your niece. Yep. Say good morning to you and good morning to Ashley. We know she's a big fan. Yes, you, and she's, Ashley. you know, a cancer patient right now, my beautiful niece, and she's in the emergency room watching us because her white count is up. All the cancer patients out there know what I'm talking about when you're going through chemo and you have that white count go up. It's a little scary, but... Um, well, we hope we can be a yes. little hug for her in the morning. Yes, and, and great, all right? of you, anybody out there fighting it, you know, yeah. just know you're a warrior and um, our energy is with you, mine Absolutely. and Ashley. Sending good. lots of love to you, Absolutely. Ashley. Yeah. All right, so let's talk about Amber Brown. We're very excited. Mm -hmm. And it was based on a book series, as I mentioned. Uh, a girl's going through a lot of changes in her life, including a, her parents' divorce. What else? Tell us a little more. Well, it's really about, I mean, just talking about my niece, you know, I have a bunch of nieces and nephews, and of course, I'm close to all of them. Ashley was born when I was working at Second City mm -hmm. back in the days, and uh, my whole family's been a big part of the show, because so much of it is personal for me, even though it's based on the books from Paula Danzinger. The family was kind enough to let me explore and heighten the characters and bring them into present day. And Amber, the whole show is for the whole family. Mm -hmm. um, we were talking about it before we were on the air. Just, uh, Actually, I try to write from my heart and with humor, like I my mom instilled in me. And I, not. it's been so much fun to kind of share my family's sense of humor and love through this series. And I hope it touches it people. You talked a little bit about your mom. We're so sorry to hear of your loss. I know how close you are, but I know that it was important to her for you to address family, different mm. issues in family. And would yeah. she have just loved oh, this so there's much? there's mom yes, with is. her pies. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah. It, you know, I'm, um, I think a part of me will always be grieving the loss of my mom. Mm. <laughs> sorry. Oh. But, um, yeah, I mean, I'm I'm inspired by her constantly, and she'd always talk to me about the ripple effect. You know, you're a storyteller, Bonnie. Remember the ripple effect. Be mindful, because what you put out there has an effect on people. You're doing it. So I was watching it yesterday, and it's the kind of show you can watch with your kids, and it's okay. It feels like a safe space. Yeah. Talk to me about this Amber Brown, this main mm. character. She had me at hello. Yeah. She is, I was just like, where did they find this little girl? Yeah. She's well, adorable. you know, we had a great casting team, brought us everybody, and I was telling you before the break that, I mean, before we were on that um, we didn't put any descriptions of our characters you know we just said 
mother, daughter, just that kind of thing and a, and a personality. And we were able to see so many people. And then we, you know, the minute Carson was on screen, my mom was actually- That's her name, Carson? Carson so Rose. Cute. And mom and I were watching on Zoom. You know, I was doing all the auditions on Zoom at that time during right. the pandemic. And Carson came on the screen and my mom and I looked at each other just when she was just talking, because I always talk to the kids mm -hmm. instead of have them just read the script. And yeah, she was delightful and charismatic and authentic and she could feel the heart of the character and that Great. was most important to me and she's phenomenal. Bonnie, sorry, but I gotta go through your IMDB because <laughs> we've got so you many- You and every guy on the so planet. <laughs> <laughs> so many good ones. Dave, Jerry Maguire. Yeah. Uh, you had your own TV show, you had your own daytime talk show. We were thinking, is there something- When are you gonna you finally you? succeed? Oh, no, <laughs> stop. Give me a break. What's gonna stick? Is there, what ties it all together for you? Ooh. Uh, storytelling and and the how magical uh, storytelling is when I you know I'm an oncology nurse former oncology nurse but I still work as a volunteer advocate and my time at the hospital I would see people facing their own mortalities and in a moment we would watch something on TV together and I'd see them completely free for mm. a second mm. and I realized even as a child my dad would watch the Andy Griffith show all of a sudden the pressure of having seven children and being a blue-collar guy he'd be laughing and escape right. for a moment so that's really powerful and I hope my writing whether it was Return to Me which I wrote or all my talk shows or TV shows whatever it is my energy is oh can I have that effect on somebody at home right it's now escape, so, you right? do it's you good. do man it's oh, great to spend fascinated. time with you it's so Bonnie. great to see you here yes. yeah, Bonnie thank you so much everybody Amber Brown debuts on Apple TV plus this Friday you got to go check it out now tonight with Joshua Johnson streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News now Hallie Jackson now weekdays at 5 on NBC News now And good evening from New Orleans. Nice to really spend some time with you. Appreciate it. Mr. Secretary, when is this going to get better? You came into this job saying you were to fight crime. Have you been successful? You found a way to put that. Can you update us on the status of negotiations? Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Ah, oh, the ocean waves, the warm sand, a bustling boardwalk. There's nothing like summertime at the beach. It's true. So Hoda and I hopped in our pedicab at the world-famous Coney Island in Brooklyn to surprise some unsuspecting beachgoers with a little wheeling and dealing. We're at Coney Island. Coney Island is historic. Yes. I mean, people have come here for generations. If you were alive in the 1800s, this is where you'd, you'd be. You'd hang here. We're on the boardwalk, which is packed with families and people. They're about to get something much better than all this. Yeah. Forget the terrifying ride on a roller coaster. What? You want to you know, know why? Why? Because we're wheeling and, and dealing. Oh, yeah. Virginia. Charleston. All okay. right, y'all ready to play? What is the nickname for the popular summer clothing trend <laughs> that stems from Nancy Meyers' looks? Beachy bohemian or coastal grandmother? Come on, uh, you know it. Coastal grandmother? Coastal grandmother! Oh! We are giving you a Coney Island staple. You guys get to go have lunch. A Nathan's famous. famous hot dog. We love oh, you! Yeah. We saw Hoda and Jenna coming on this fight. Uh, I think we went. Woo! 
<laughs> what are your names? I'm Hilda. Yeah. Hi, Hilda. Rod. Hi, Rod. Hi, Miriam. Hi, Miriam. Guess how many Grammy Awards Lady Gaga has? 10, 13, or 15? I'm going with lucky 13. Yeah! Yes. 13 is my lucky number! Yeah. You are getting tickets to the Cyclones baseball game! Woo. We get to go home with all kinds of fun stuff. It turned out to be perfect. Yeah, it's oh, a yeah. great day. <laughs> Oh my God, look at that thing. No, it's like Absol a bungee. Oh my God, they go down Absolutely straight space. Not. We are in a deal in. Let's go. Can we give you an early anniversary present? Yes. We would like to send you to Chicago. Are you okay. kidding me? And not just the two of you, six tickets to Chicago. Oh, thank you, that's great. Is that a cool that's idea? Yeah. Wonderful, thank you. Yeah. Hi guys. Hey y'all. What are y'all's names? My name is Bronte. Yeah. And I'm Rama. Where are you guys from? Here. We're from Brooklyn, New York. Just came here to get some sun. Yeah, have, a, have a hot dog, ride a ride. Yeah. Do what you do. All right, we got a question if you want to wheel and deal. Okay, ready? As it was, Watermelon Sugar and Adore You are all hit by what singer? Harry Styles. Yeah! You guys are going to the Statue of Liberty. Oh, it yes, is baby. Huge, oh, it's so worth it. You'll board the city experience, the statue. You're going to Ellis Island. You got your torch. Did y'all yes. enjoy the New York Thank experience? <laughs> Folks, come on up. Are you guys ready? Yes. What is the adaptation of The Wizard of Oz that was filmed here at Coney Island? Was it The Wiz, Journey Back to Oz, or Wicked? The Wiz. Oh. Get lunch at Nathan's famous hot dog and, and restaurant. And we got hot dog hats. Okay, go enjoy it. Y'all look so cute. Thank you guys. Which famous director went to high school in Coney Island? This is so weird. Is it Jordan Peele? Is it Spike Lee? Or is, or is it, it Steven Spielberg? Spielberg? Spike Lee. Yes! Is that crazy? You guys yes. are getting summer concert tickets to the Jones Beach concert venue, and you get to pick whatever concert you want to go to whenever you want to go, whenever they're playing, okay? And up to six tickets so y'all can all go and bring two friends. <laughs> See you later, Coney. Bye, we love you. <laughs> Okay, you so want to come back tomorrow. You know why? We've got Grammy winner oh. Maren Morris. She's going to treat us to an amazing concert, a rare Thursday concert on That's the That's going to be amazing. We'll see you then. Sponsored by Walmart. Welcome to the Today All Day Kitchen. We're serving up the best brunch ever for the Today Table. This morning, we're cooking up three cozy dishes that will satisfy anyone on Team Savory or Team Sweet. I'll be making cheesy loaded potato waffles with bacon. And I'll be whipping up a decadent French toast bake with a banana's foster sauce. And I'm making three colorful rainbow smoothie bowls with homemade granola. Whether you're planning a special meal or just want to make the weekends more fun, it's time to build a better brunch. You can shop the ingredients featured here from our sponsor, Walmart, by scanning the QR code. Today earns a commission from purchases made through links on today.com. When I was a kid, my mom made most of the meals during the week. But on the weekends, my dad took charge of breakfast duty. French toast was his specialty, so I'm getting super nostalgic today with an amped up version of my childhood fave. The Bananas Foster Sauce takes French toast to the next level in this recipe. I mean, who doesn't love a little rum in the morning? But first, let's get started with the luscious custard. I'm going to start by combining all of my dry ingredients. We are going in with one cup of granulated sugar. We are going to add in one teaspoon of kosher salt. I'm also going to be adding in some warming spices. So we have our classic ground cinnamon. 
right here. And then as an optional add-on, I'm also going to be adding in some ground nutmeg and some ground ginger powder. My dad only used cinnamon, but I wanted to give it a little bit of a restaurant quality twist. Next up, we are going to add our wet ingredients. We have heavy cream. This is going to make it super rich and luxurious. We have some whole milk. We'll whisk this on up. We're going to add in one teaspoon of vanilla extract. I'm actually going to crack my eggs into this measuring cup and then I will put them into the large bowl. The reason why is if I accidentally get any shells, I'll be very easily able to remove them. Going to break up all of these yolks and give it a nice whisk. We will add that into our liquid mixture. And this is a standard custard that we've just made here. Okay, so now that our custard is done, we are going to butter our nine by 13 inch baking dish. My favorite way to butter a dish is to actually use a paper towel. It does a really great job of grabbing onto the butter and allowing you to get into all of those nooks and crannies. We are using challah bread today. It just does such a good job of absorbing that custard and it gives you a really creamy French toast that still has a nice crispy exterior. So we have sliced up this challah into one inch thick pieces and we've dried it out. When you dry out your bread, it actually does a better job of absorbing all of the custard. Okay, time to delicately pour our custard over the top of this French toast. And something that I also really like to do is I'll just take these pieces and kind of press them down into the custard, give it a nice custard bath. It's so funny because when I think about the French toast that my dad used to make, super simple. It was white bread, egg, milk. He didn't even measure it. But the best thing was the song that he sang. He used to, <laughs> while he'd be making the French toast, he would sing this song. And I remember it very vividly to this day. It goes, French toasty, French toasty. It's the toasty with the mosty. And he would just sing it over and over again. And he'd be like, sing it with me. And we'd be like, French toasty, French toasty. It's the toasty with the mosty. Good times. Oh, the good old days to be a kid. I like to cover this and pop it into the refrigerator for at least one hour to soak up all of that custardy goodness. Then when I'm ready to bake, I will preheat my oven to 350 degrees pop this into the oven and cook it for about 40 to 45 minutes. While our French toast is baking up in the oven, I'm gonna get started on our bananas foster sauce. We have three medium ripe bananas and we're just going to peel them. And this is a really fun alternative to maple syrup. And then I like cutting these on a bias. It just looks really elevated when you slice it on an angle. We'll do the same with the rest of these. We're gonna toast them up before we serve them. So we'll turn our heat to low, add in one tablespoon of unsalted butter. Now that our butter is nice and bubbly, we are going to add our bananas into the pan. Toss those in there. We just wanna get 